Good morning. Good morning. It's Monday. It's April 15th. It's tax day. It's sentencing day for Hannah Gutierrez. Read the armor on the set of Rust. She was convicted by jury after about a 10 day trial in March. And today is the day for her sentencing. Before we go into court today, we have to cover a few documents helpful for us. It seems that court has pushed back about a half an hour. Um, this court has not run on time literally ever, but this could be a ton of reasons. This could be getting um, those who are making impact statements into court. It could be dealing with potential security issues. We're going to talk about those. It could be um, dealing with transport of the defendant from jail and, and that running late. There's a lot of reasons court could be running late. So what we're going to do this morning before court starts, we're going to go over the state's response. I think most of you have watched Quick Bits. If you have not, I will give a summary of what the state said for sentencing. And then the defendant filed a response that just popped up on the public website. So we're gonna look at what the defense has to say, and I'm sure it's gonna be some version of double fingers in the air. So there's lots to talk about today. I'm gonna go ahead and roll the intro. We're gonna cover these filings and then we're gonna see what the court's going to do. Here's what I'm curious about today. One, what is this sentence gonna be? Is it gonna be the, hey, do probation and then it'll be like none of this ever happened? Is it going to be the maximum? Hey, go to prison for 18 months, goodbye. Or is it gonna be somewhere in between, either a suspended sentence or a slightly uh, smaller sentence, one year of county jail and then probation? We're gonna see, we're gonna see what happens. I will put up some polls about that in a minute, but for now, we need to get rolling. For everyone who's like, the lips, the shirt, I, I had to go out in public this morning, y'all. I had, I had to go out in public. <laughs> This is public facing Emily sometimes. <laughs> Don't worry. I recorded this week's episode at like midnight last night um, in a hoodie. So we're, we're back to Emily the way you know her in other content. But I'm very interested to see how this goes down. We're going to roll the intro and look at those documents. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> let's get into it. So for a quick summary, Hannah Gutierrez was the armorer on the set of the movie Rust in New Mexico. She was in charge of checking the bullets, checking the weapons, making sure everything on safe was set. She was also working as an assistance prop manager, which didn't seem to go very well. As we know, oh, did I forget my earrings chat? Brilliant, I did. Hold on, we'll, we'll do them while we're doing the summary. No, we'll do them after the summary. We'll do them while we're going over documents. <laughs> It happens sometimes. Today was today was busy. Um, we'll we'll get we'll get them in a second. So she was the armor on the set of Rust. She was in charge of checking the guns, the weapons, all of the things to make it safe. She was working as an assistant props master with Sarah Zachary. That did not go well, as we heard at trial. She called uh, she called Sarah Zachary a see you next Tuesday um, on multiple occasions, which came out in court. The prosecutor said it multiple multiple times sometimes when you get to curse in court though you just can't help yourself and you're like wait what did you say wait excuse me i didn't hear that properly this after about a 10-day trial she was convicted of involuntary manslaughter she was not convicted of tampering with evidence it was a stupid charge from the beginning but you know what that shows to me it shows to me that the jury was paying very close attention to what was going on in this trial. They weren't just like, yeah, whatever with her. They paid attention and parsed out this evidence. And that is good to note as we get into the prosecution's filing and the um, jail calls. If you've heard them in quick bits, this is going to be a bit of a summary. But we're going to get to the, I'm going to make sure we get to the defense's response before we go to live court, because I really want to see what the defense has to say in response to the prosecution, pointing out what Hannah has said in her jail calls. 
it's uh it's not great at this point the defense is asking for a conditional discharge as i was reading that i was like wait what wait can you do that after a verdict generally after a jury verdict in jurisdictions i've worked in and every jurisdiction is different you can do a suspended sentence where you get a term of probation whatever that term may be and a bunch of conditions and if you violate probation then the hammer drops and you just get you just get that sentence there's no more discussion about it other than maybe a violation hearing hey um you you had a suspended sentence you didn't do what you were supposed to do on probation now the hammer drops whatever amount of time was set just falls into place and away you go that's not what a conditional discharge is a conditional discharge is uh probation with a bunch of conditions and if you do not violate those conditions it discharges the verdict it discharges the finding of guilt which means that there would be no conviction for this case and the prosecutor as if she was watching my content answered it in the very first question yes miss gutierrez is eligible for conditional discharge which was unclear from the defense's filings the defense filings have been uh sometimes scant in the things that uh we need to know and that's been frustrating so we're going to go to the state's response um and my earrings i took off the earrings i was wearing ah i dropped one. Oh no oh no it re it's all the way under the desk uh it's it's going to be a day hold on we ca we cannot we cannot we cannot This is why I don't stream on a Monday. Today's gonna be the monday -iest Monday ever. When we get to Q&A after this sentencing, I'll tell you all about, um, I'll tell you all about my weekend. It's been an adventure. Uh, and so this is par for the course at this point, but literally we can't have an earring down, like crisis averted. Thank you, chat, for keeping me all the way together. Um, I was so excited to get on to streaming, even though court was pushed back. I was like, we gotta go. I didn't even look. I didn't even look, didn't even notice totally forgot okay uh, we feel we feel better we're like all together all right we have 15 minutes i'm like go <laughs> state's response to defendant's sentencing memorandum and request for conditional discharge the state opposes defendant's request for a conditional discharge while it is true that miss gutierrez is eligible for a conditional discharge the state asserts that miss gutierrez should not be granted a conditional conditional discharge because Upon her arrival in New Mexico, she swiftly committed a host of felonies and has another felony charge pending before Judge Ellington for intentionally hiding a firearm from security, a local bar, to get the firearm into the bar. Don't take weapons to bars. What are you doing? Upon successfully circumventing the security at the bar, she went into the restroom and made a selfie video stating, quote, they checked my purse, but they didn't check my butt cheeks. Wah, wah, wah. Or is it wah, wah? Like, what is the wah, wah, wah? Like, how, how are we feeling about that wah, wah, wah? Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah. Girl, again, I hope you have a tushy before you're sticking your firearm into your butt. Also, not medical advice, maybe don't. You guys think it's sad tram trombone. You're like, okay, wait a second. I have a, tr I have a trombone, but they didn't check my butt cheeks. <laughs> at the same time she can be seen, at the same time she was speaking, she held up a nickel-plated semi-automatic pistol in front of the camera. There is additional evidence that has previously been presented to the court that she was in possession of cocaine while in New Mexico while working. There's also um, 
evidence that there was alcohol in her hotel room, even while she was out on release and not supposed to be drinking, which is often a term of probation. The state also opposes conditional discharge due to Gutierrez's complete and total failure to accept responsibility for her actions, as demonstrated by summaries below of some of her jail calls. These are just some of her jail calls. Since her incarceration on March 6th, look, y'all, it's April 15th. That's a lot of jail calls between like March 6th and now. This is a short period of time. Gutierrez continues to deny responsibility and blame others. She goes as far as to blame the set medic, the paramedics who attempted to save Miss Hutchins, and even blames the child actor on set for picking up the gun. Moreover, there are references to Gutierrez being in possession of alcohol during the time the trial was taking place and continuing to consume alcohol contrary to her conditions of release while on pretrial release with her boyfriend. Stunningly, Gutierrez requested during jail calls that her legal team request that Miss Hutchins's husband and son be contacted and asked to speak on her behalf at her sentencing. Do you think they'll be there to speak against her or submit a statement? If they submit a statement, I bet Carrie Morrissey will read it into the record. She continued to complain in her jail calls about the negative effects this incident, this incident has had on her life and her modeling career while never expressing genuine remorse at any time. She expressed a willingness to violate future court orders should she be subpoenaed for the Baldwin trial. She referred to the jurors as um, a, a offensive slur that was levied against me in junior high, so I'm not reading it. Idiots and assholes and suggested that her mother could confront undersigned counsel, the prosecutor, in the restroom because counsel uses the same restroom as the public. If you have watched my Quick Bits episode, you know um, that I am personally offended as someone who has had this happen. I've told the story of being confronted in the women's public restroom um, by family members of a defendant. It, it's uh, it's not a good thing for anyone involved. It can be very dangerous and it's not, uh, it's not ideal, but I've told that story in full in members only. And I talked about it a bit in, uh, in the quick bits. That's not gonna go well. Uh, threatening the prosecutor isn't going to benefit anyone. It's just, it's not gonna help. <sighs> Surprisingly, Miss Gutierrez doesn't seem to mind being in jail and at times appears to genuinely enjoy it. Yeah, she, and her, you know, jail bestie are just chilling. The prosecution also asked to designate the uh, offense as serious and violent. I don't, I think for me that that might be a, a bridge too far because the entire point of an involuntary manslaughter is that it is negligent and, rec and reckless, but it is an accident. I see serious and violent offenses, um, especially as generally considered by the legislature, as intentional, volitional offenses. You are choosing to be violent and you are choosing to stab, shoot, maim, injure. Um, I don't see how a reckless accident falls under this. So while I agree that she's not remorseful, I don't necessarily agree that the serious and violent offense designation is uh, necessarily appropriate and not an overreach. What it does though, is it gives the court something to discount. It gives the court a, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. And I think that that's appropriate, letting the court, letting the court discard something that the prosecution has asked for, and then, uh, sentencing her uh, to time if that's what's going to happen. I think with these jail calls, a custodial sentence looks more likely than it did uh, a week ago because the jail calls just show a complete lack of remorse and a lack of ability to take responsibility and like a plotting for not just how to manipulate the system, but we can pretend I don't have the like, um, safe code for the weapons, even though she's going to be restricted from weapons. Like, oh, I could just, this is how we could say it. Or, oh, let's make sure we use her father's leukemia to say, I'm a caregiver and make sure that we say that to the court. So there is a lot of, um, manipulative behavior versus let's just tell the court the truth. Also, Hey, let's 
choose which pay stubs we show to say I'm working full time instead of part time. There's definitely a uh, desire and a entitlement to stretch the truth coming across from these jail calls. I'm going to go to what the defense has to say, and then we're going to zoom zoom back to the jail calls. The defense filing is six pages, and this is a first look, and we need to do that. And then we'll get back to those jail calls. A lot of you have heard them in quick bits, but we will get there. Also, I'm sure Carrie Morrissey is going to reiterate them. Defense reply to state's response to defendant's sentencing memo and request for conditional discharge. Hannah Gutierrez, through lawyers, asks or now responds or replies to the state's uh, memo. The state asks that Ms. Gutierrez be sentenced to 18 months with a designation of serious violent offender due to her extreme re recklessness while working as an armor on the set of Rust. Yet the state has recently made other statements exculpatory to Ms. Gutierrez Reed and the notion that she was extremely reckless in the case against Alec Baldwin. Oh, so we're using the prosecution's words against them, are we? Hmm. Hmm. They can't have it both ways consistent with the prosecutor's duty to do justice and seek the truth. Look, here's the thing. Two people can be extremely, extremely reckless and cause this thing. Two people can be responsible for this at once. In the Baldwin case, in a response to Baldwin's motion to dismiss, I mean, 300 pages, the special prosecutors contend that Baldwin had absolutely no control of his own emotions while on set. Oh, okay. The filming further, the filing further states that during filming, Baldwin demanded a faster and faster pace from the crew and armor Hannah Gutierrez Reed, which resulted in a relentless rushing of the crew and a routine compromise of safety measures. But I think what the experts showed is that it was her job to push back, even at the risk of getting fired. The response states that Baldwin frequently shouted and cursed at crew members either directed at individuals or no one in particular, demonstrating a lack of concern for the impact of his conduct and those around him. Baldwin being an asshole and Hannah not checking the weapon are two factors in causing the death of Helena Hutchins, but one action doesn't excuse the other. The response noted that numerous crew members observed Gutierrez's lack of experience. And Baldwin, the film's producer, failed to address the concerns. The response concluded that Hannah Gutierrez's negligence and inexperience, coupled with Baldwin's alleged lack of safety, resulted in Hutchins' death. Yeah, how does that help you? How does that help you? That doesn't help. Like, that. that's not... And if the state believes all of this, which it must because it wrote it... Can you just argue estoppel if that's what you're arguing and just call it what it is? If the state believes all of this, which it must because it wrote these things in a pleading, I, Bulls, I can't deal with your writing anymore, sir. I mean, Avi, they believe it. They like put it in a filing. And no doubt will assert them at Baldwin's trial that Miss Gutierrez Reed did the best she could under poor circumstances and made a mistake or at worst was negligent under terribly rushed circumstances. She was reckless under bad circumstances. That's not that's that's not exculpatory this is precisely what osha found and what miss gutierrez reed stated in her defense at trial and the jury didn't agree the jury was like okay can we convict baldwin too like let's go we'll convict baldwin and her like but that's not the question before us the state cannot have it both ways they're not trying to consistent with our obligation to the truth indeed that is our entire system's obligation to find the truth. Ms. Gutierrez has felt real sadness and remorse over the tragic events. She has experienced this largely in public and has sought counseling to deal with her emotions and mental breakdowns. The prosecutor's highlighting of Ms. Gutierrez Reed's jail calls, evidencing frustration at the system, does not detract from Gutierrez Reed's, from Gutierrez Reed's heartbreak and extreme sadness over what occurred on the rust set. Counsel, really? She she said a she said a lot about the fucking idiot jurors and said that in stronger terms. She said the judge was paid off. She said that uh, the prosecutor is a bitch, 
and that the prosecutor and all the witnesses lied, how is that showing genuine sadness? Like, unless there's a jail call that the prosecution didn't highlight, which if they didn't, it would be shady, where she said, I can't believe Alec Baldwin did all of this to make this set so unsafe. I am heartbroken that this happened. I am horrified that this happened. Or why aren't we trying to get to the truth? Why are they just focused on me? Film sets are going to continue to be dangerous if they're just focusing on me. Why aren't they doing more to prosecute more people? Maybe she was. We just haven't seen it. We live in a country, however, where people are accorded some latitude in stating even unpopular opinions. I mean, sir, I wish we lived in that world. I don't know if we're there at the moment. I, I believe people should be able to state unpopular opinions. I don't know if her jail calls are just that, though. Where people are accorded some latitude in stating even unpopular opinions and statements which are wrong and lamentable. Oh, the name, the, the name calling. The system still has an obligation to move forward in an unbiased manner with respect to all aspects, including sentencing, but they're allowed to consider evidence of remorse. And just saying that all the jurors are fucking idiots is derivative. The special prosecutor and reductive, the special prosecutors have reached at, or the special prosecutors have reacted at times in pleadings with an evident bias and retaliatory attitudes towards Miss Gutierrez Reed. Are they going to talk about her, uh, her healthy ego as well, counsel? I think they were reacting to you. Yet, what really matters is the conduct that is being punished. Here, by the prosecutor's own words, Miss Gutierrez Reed was plagued with an experience. She wanted the job. Plagued by an experience, yes. And I think they also mentioned that she was a Nepo baby. And working on a rush set caused by production in Baldwin and her negligence in that atmosphere should be considered in totality in the sentence by this court. The totality should be considered. I don't know if it helps. But the inexperiences of her own making, I don't know if that's like a, a pox upon her house. Like what, what kind of plague are we dealing with? Sorry. 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 What, what plague are we dealing with is something I want to know. Also, I'm keeping an eye on court as we go through these, uh, as we go through these hearings, uh, or through these documents. So as just to keep you guys in the loop, I am also keeping an eye on court. Actually, I need, I need two of those. Hold on. We're going to keep it in another window too. Give me one second. This is Emily behind this, Emily behind the scenes. I need to be able to see it in two ways. Cause we will. All right, you guys, tell me, would you rather keep an eye on the courtroom and I read the document or would you rather um, or would you rather see the document? You guys let me know in the chat real quick which you would prefer. See the courtroom, read the document, see the courtroom, read the document. OK, we'll see the courtroom. We will read the document. It's going to take me a minute to pull the document up in a different window. So give me one second um because i need a third screen the way i need a third the way i need a third screen uh let me just move these around and we can do that emily needs more screens all right see the courtroom good good chat good good we will do that let's do it this way and then we will go for all of you that said document courtroom one overwhelmingly, but if if they cut the feed for any reason, we will shift and go elsewhere. Uh, I will just be reading, reading this. Let me change the size. All right. I have to, uh, let's see. I'm gonna have to make the courtroom a little bit smaller so I can do these side by side. All right, quick layout adjustment because live streaming is uh, dynamic. No, that looks worse. That works. That works okay. Um, Carrie Morrissey is bringing people into the courtroom, which means they are probably people who either want to make impact statements or are connected to this case. And that is why the prosecutor is bringing uh, folks in and showing them where they can sit. We see that people have press badges. Is that Gloria Allred in blue? 
Yep, sure is. I wonder who she's representing. Oh, she's representing Mamie Mitchell. Um, she, uh, Mingalina Toe, Chris, yes. She's representing Mamie Mitchell. No wonder Gloria Allred is sitting there in court behind the defendant because she is representing uh, the script supervisor. Okay, back to back to what the defense has to say as we're watching people come into court. There's Mr. Bowles, there's Hannah, and uh, there is the paralegal who we have heard so much about in filings. Why are they flipped in the courtroom? They're sitting on opposite sides than they sat on for trial. Um, I wonder if she is looking at her mom in the courtroom because she was clearly looking at someone in the courtroom. Let's get back to the defense motion. The defense says, yet yeah, what really matters is the conduct being punished. Um, in another, wait, indeed, in yet another very problematic occurrence in the case. How many lawyers do you know that are, are saying problematic? Like, how has this become legal jargon that problematic is now like accepted in legal filings? Indeed, in yet another very problematic occurrence in this case last week, the special prosecutor disclosed to counsel for the first time Oh dear. For the first time, a prior interview of Seth Kinney with the district attorney's office investigators that lasted two and a half hours. Bulls, why aren't you leading with this? What the fuck, Carrie? You can't disclose that after the trial. Jesus fucking Christ, Carrie. You can't not disclose interviews to the defense. <gasps> Lead, dude, why aren't you leading with the legal problems? lead with the legal lead with the legal problems this 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 is a huge problem oh my god bulls way to bury the lead well i'm sure they have much to talk about if carrie didn't turn over an interview of a testifying witness i would be making a motion for new trial State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez. All right, we're going to have to take a pause on that um, filing with Bowles bearing the lead. We're going to go to the sentencing in full screen, and then we will be back to these motions when we get to Q&A. But the defense arguing that the DA's office has not turned over all the witness interviews, I'm surprised that they kept that in a sentencing memo and did not that make that a much bigger deal because it is a very very big deal so unless he misrepresented something all right matter i'm calling is uh, state of new mexico versus hannah gutierrez d101cr 202340 party state their name uh carrie morrissey and jason lewis on behalf of the state of new mexico good morning your honor jason bulls and carmela cisneros are here for mr terrace reed who is also present where's her other attorney all right this is a sentencing Let's interesting proceed um they're proceeding to sentencing let me make it louder real quick thank you uh chat and Megalina. we are gonna gain that up as much as we can all right let's go back to court um i have this sped up just a touch so that we can uh, get up to real time i'm surprised the courtroom isn't more full your honor i i wasn't sure exactly what recommendation would be appropriate in this unprecedented case until last week when you saw the jail calls. when i completed the review of ms gutierrez's jail calls uh, it was my sincere hope during this process that there would be some moment when ms gutierrez took responsibility um expressed some level of remorse that was genuine no it is distorted i'm trying to make sure we can hear it and it was fine and then it started distorting so let's gain it down a little and that moment has never come oh carrie ms gutierrez continues to refuse to accept responsibility for her role in the death of helena hutchins um Rather than accept responsibility, she has chosen to place blame on the witnesses who testified against her. Me. The jurors. You. The jurors. The set medic. And the paramedics who tried to save Ms. Hutchins' life. 
her jail calls, and there were probably close to 200 of them. She's had Tell a lot us of phone who Ms. Gutierrez really is. And in the, in the state's opinion, uh, the content and tone of her calls demonstrates that Ms. Gutierrez should not receive any type of a reduced sentence. Helena Hutchins died due to a cascade of safety violations that began with Ms. Gutierrez introducing live rounds to the movie set, loading one into a prop gun, telling the members of the crew that it was a cold gun, thereby ensuring that it would make its way into the hands of Mr. Baldwin. That conduct, absent responsibility or remorse, is deserving of a sentence of 18 months in the Department of Corrections with a designation as a serious violent offender. Mm. And that is what the state will be requesting today. Mm. Um, and those are the only arguments I intend to make in terms of sentencing. I would like to move into the presentation uh, of the witnesses who would like to address the court on behalf of Ms. Hutchins and her family. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to start with Craig Mizrahi. Mr. Mizrahi. Witness impact statements often make me cry. I am worried very much that I do not have Kleenex. Um, I'm gonna slow these down because they deserve the time and thought of normal Your speed. Honor. It is very difficult for people to do this. My name is Craig this. Mizrahi and I was Helena's agent. I was compelled to be present today to his mic's on your honor why is this frozen why is it frozen is that better yes okay. i was compelled to be present today to express the impact of the loss of helena who was a cherished friend wife mother and artist senselessly lost on october 21st 2021 i was first introduced to helena when a mutual friend sent me samples of her cinematography I was pleasantly surprised to see how mature and refined it was, especially given the small budgets she was working with. I imagined what she could do if given the time and resources of a large film, and I instantly knew I wanted to work with her. What stood out for me was her passion, her intense preparation, her resourcefulness and creativity on he looks set, just like Isaac and the kindness and generosity know she showed to all those she worked with. In getting to know her husband, Matt, it was clear that he and their son, Andros, supported every career move she made and accepted the very difficult reality that she would have to travel for work very often. This rare combination of talent, work ethic, collaboration, and family support was what truly set her apart. In 2021, Helena's star continued to rise. Her name was mentioned around Hollywood as someone to watch, and just two weeks before she began on Rust, Helena got her first meeting on a big studio film. She came in a close second for that job, and instead of focusing on why it didn't go her way, she felt great confidence that she was finally playing with the big boys. When Russ came her way, she felt excited for the visual challenge that a Western would bring. She enjoyed meeting the director, Joel, and believed in his vision for the film, so we went for it. And Joel Two days before she died, her. Helena called me. It was very late, but she wanted to say she just had dinner with Joel and Alec, and she was so happy to be working with them. She felt the film would be a great next step and was excited for what was to come in 2022. I agreed and said, sleep I don't well, know if she's actually crying. Big day. That was the last time I spoke to Helena. October 21st was a fateful day that would change the lives of so many. Most of all, Andros, who at nine years old, would have to somehow comprehend the terrifying reality of losing his mother in this way. In the time that's passed, while the pain persists, the circumstances surrounding the disaster force upon us so many questions, with one in particular above all, how could this have happened? It's my opinion that generally speaking, film producers well, are responsible know to ensure happened. the cast and crew members hired are experienced enough to handle their jobs. And when it comes to hiring the armor on a Western, I believe safety is the only job. Yep. So when the producers hired someone with virtually no experience to not only be the armor, but also the assistant prop master, two very challenging positions in their own right, they made a crucial decision to put sa the safety of their cast and crew on the back burner. As for Ms. This Gutierrez, isn't gonna work, it's Hannah. my opinion that she should not have held either position, much less both, but that once accepted, the responsibility should have been taken more seriously. Yes. Sadly, it wasn't. Yes. And we all know the result. I agree. Since that terrible day, I've spoken with hundreds of producers, film executives, and directors about how we can come together as an industry to make sets safer from gun violence. But the truth is that if Ms. Gutierrez-Reed and the producers of Rust 
simply followed the decades-old written guidelines for that the film industry, already in place. specifically the use of firearms and ammunition, this tragedy would never have happened. Yep. In that sense, I hope we can all agree that this was not a simple accident. It was a chain of events that led to the killing of someone, and that chain would have been broken if the armor was doing the job. If Hannah did her job, did. we wouldn't be here. I often think about what Helena's future would have been, and it makes me smile. I can assure you it would have been bright, filled with spending time with Andros and watching him grow up. She would have been able to help her support her family in Ukraine, especially when they needed her most through the horror of war. She would have traveled the world shooting beautiful images and eventually becoming the director that would change hearts and minds with her poignant and purposeful storytelling. In the end, she'd likely finish her career as she started at the American Film Institute, getting back to the next generation of, of filmmakers. Sadly, we'll never know because Helena's life was taken away from us much too soon. So today we stand determined to seek justice for Helena, to hold accountable those responsible for her death, and to ensure that such a tragedy never occurs again. All of again. them. All of the people I want to thank Ms. Morrissey and her team for having me here today. And thank you, Your Honor, for your service in the case. Thank you. It was a very heartfelt, without being... Um, Emilia Mendieta. Overly drawn uh statement it is hard her son and my son are the same age your honor my name is amelia mendieta i was one of helena's best friends and one of her colleagues oh, in the class best he's gonna kill me at the american film institute conservatory oh ma'am helena and i met on august 2013 in the registration line on our first day at the american film institute conservatory I was quietly suffering through a small bout of imposter syndrome and desperately trying to hide my nerves about officially starting the cinematography program. I don't think I was hiding them very well because this joyful, energetic woman bounced right over to me and invited me out to lunch. We then piled into a RAV4, already chock full of film gels and diffusion that almost hit the baby seat in the back from view, and off we went. After a quick burrito and some pastries, we headed back to campus for our first orientation sessions. We were friends ever since. But that was Lena, a joyful soul who could just as easily strike up a friendship as she could capture a beautiful image. Even while at AFI, Helena stood out as an exceptional artist and cinematographer. She was creative and ambitious and quickly became well known for her skills and insistent pursuit of excellence. The first time I got to work with her, on her was on her second film on her first year. I was on her camera team. Her love and passion for lighting was evident and you could tell that she was masterful in her approach even then. I'm pretty sure she used every single light on the grip and lighting truck, but she used them, used them well. It's also the film where I broke a blue streak filter that she had borrowed from one of her classmates as I was rushing to get it to her. Why are we changing the as audio? I showed her the, blue sh the filter shards, apologizing God. profusely because I felt I had ruined her project. I could see she was disappointed, not at me, but at the fact that she would have to rethink her ridiculously planned creative approach. A feat she accomplished as she went along with the rest of the day. This is not as I was profusely apologizing a rap yet again, she pulled me into a big hug and said, Emmy, it's just a filter. They break. Friendships don't break over a filter. Despite the great fil filter incident in the first year, we went on to collaborate on most projects at AFI and beyond. At first, we crewed for each other on our first year films, our visual essays, and our first feature films. After that, as our careers grew, we leaned on each other for emotional and technical support. She even stepped in front of the camera for a music video I shot and directed despite her aversion to being on that end of the lens, like most cinematographers. <laughs> but only for you, Emmy. And only this once, she quipped. <laughs> As she stared down my gaffer, sweating on the sidelines with a stare that read, I know where that light should go, and you better not put it where it should be. I love that story. I love being on her sets, or just talking with her about what she was going to do, because she was always trying something new, something innovative. She was luminous and endlessly curious. Helena would research how she wanted to accomplish something and make it happen. She had this uncanny ability to balance her career ambitions, her family life, and still lead a thriving social life. I admired and still admire that. I have no idea how she did it. I've always held her in high esteem as a classmate and colleague, but to me, she was first and foremost one of my closest friends in grad school and beyond. We were able to confide and trust in each other as we navigated the challenges of being women in cinematography. That extended to confiding in each other about navigating our personal and professional lives in the film industry at large. One of the beautiful things about our friendship is that we could just as easily wax poetic about the goat cheese salad at the cute brunch spot we had trekked out to over in Venice Beach. Goat or the chromatic aberrations of the lenses we had used on one of our last projects that you really, you know, had given the story some character. 
but really what I remember her most for was her adventures and generous spirit. As our lives and careers grew and we got busier, we'd try to meet up for a meal every month or so. It was often lunch, followed by a brisk walk, and usually ending with a coffee and pastry. She had a big sweet tooth. Whenever we would sit down to eat, she'd always look at the dessert menu first. <laughs> she favored pastries with chocolate. Okay, I do that. But she liked cookies, too. I made decorated sugar cookies for my friends on Christmas, dropping them off the second week of December. Every year without fail, not even an hour after a drop off hers at her house, she'd text me pictures of the empty cookie bag, followed by some of her and her son happily eating them in one, all in one sitting. Sometimes her son would come along with us on our outings, bouncing with energy. Her spirit mirrored in him. Her little man, she would call him. Her husband and her son were her boys, and she often spoke of them lovingly. Helena was proud of being a mom, and often spoke about how the experience changed her life, sometimes even egging me on to have kids whenever I had to find a partner. And motherhood was important to her, but I think people were important to her, and she prioritized them. A lesson I've taken to heart since her passing, and a balance that most of us in the industry struggle to achieve on a daily basis sometimes. Helena was also a social butterfly, the quintessential extrovert that had a knack for somehow going to every single event she was invited to, and being bright and bubbly and charismatic. Most of her friends were introverts, though, myself included. We'd like to joke that she had collected a small gaggle of us <laughs> along the way and made sure we showed up to these events, too. It happens. She would call you up whenever to talk to you about going to some event, and um, one that my own little introvert heart maybe would have not dared gone otherwise. <laughs> And she would make sure you weren't left alone. No man left behind. She made behind. a point to take care of us and include us. Yeah. I appreciate that. It was, still is, so hard to come out of my shell, and she made things easier socially. Now, whenever I go to an event and I'm doubting whether I should go, I ask myself, what would Helena do? The answer is usually go. Late in the summer of 2021, I got a call from her. I was prepping for my third feature film that I was starting filming in a week away, and I hadn't heard from her much since I knew she had been a different project in Canada for most of the summer. I'm at LAX, she said happily. Do you have any suggestions of where I can have good food in Santa Fe? She knew I had family in New Mexico at the time and had spoken lovingly about New Mexican cuisine before. What are you doing in New Mexico? I asked, <laughs> pouring out a small list of recommendations. I'm shooting a Western. She sounded really excited. It had been a dream for both of us to shoot genre films. It's so hard to land a genre job sometimes, and she has a soft spot for both westerns and hard sci-fi. I was really excited for her, too, and we reveled at her, reveled at her good Love fortune on the phone. It has horses and gunfights, and we're shooting out in the desert. It's a huge stepping stone for me. It's going to be so much fun, she said. And excitedly. the scenery was so beautiful. And she felt it, that it could be the project that could actually help her career propel forward. Even the shots we've seen we seen in the trial. that it would be the project that killed her. We're stunning. I often think about that moment, her excitement, her joy at embarking at this new adventure. I think about how hard she worked to get there, to get that opportunity. It kills me a little inside. The last time we spoke was the day before Russ started shooting. I called her before because a friend of mine gifted me four tickets to Disneyland that would expire by the end of the year, and I thought it would be a really nice gesture to invite Helena and her boys to the park for the day. She seemed excited about going to the park. She hadn't been in a while and felt it could be a good break after the shoot. She mentioned pre-production had been a bit hectic and stressful, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary in the independent film world. I've since begun to question what is and isn't normal and what should be happening and shouldn't. But yeah. I was fresh off my own low-budget feature experience and had a bit of the blues regarding some of my own challenges with that shoot. I confided my doubts in my career with her, my insecurities at the moment. Just another bout of imposter syndrome. To a last minute meeting, she had to go. Emmy, <clears throat> you're so young and so talented. I have no doubt that you'll make it in this industry. I believe in you. I believe you're an amazing cinematographer in person. Please remember that. You gotta go. We'll talk soon. Love you. Those were the we last four words she ever friend. said to me. I believe in you. Those four words will forever echo in my soul. They're a bright light in the darkness of this whole situation. They keep me going when times get tough, and times have been tough. I was working at a news station in Sacramento, California on October 21st, 2021. Oh, God. But I heard the news through the grapevine. Oh. One of my mentors called me to tell me something had happened on a set in New Mexico. They wanted to know if I'd spoken to Helena. That's the I'm not. worst. I was able to get in contact with her husband, who confirmed the worst. I confirmed the news to another one of our mentors. 
I heard his heart break over the phone, too. I sat alone in the darkness of my apartment for hours, sobbing uncontrollably. My wonderful, generous, adventurous friend was gone. Killed on a set because a live bullet that wasn't a prop gun. It dawned on me. Someone didn't do their job right. A yeah. lot of someones didn't do their job right. Yeah. I'm also a director of photography. I trained at the same school, graduated the same year, got the same degree. We belonged to the same organizations, went to the same networking, networking events, pursued the art of visual storytelling with the same passion. I've been on sets with guns. I've been on sets where blanks were fired at my camera. I know what an armorer's job is. Yeah. I know the safety procedures that must be followed. And as more and more details of the case came out, it boggled my mind how many of these procedures had been either blatantly disregarded or not followed at all. Helena's death is the result of a massive system failure where many links of the chain were loose or faulty, and they all failed her, all of them. Yeah. But it all boils down to a very simple question. Why was there a live bullet on set? And who a live bullet it? should never have made this way onto the set, let alone the gun. Full stop. And that is where Hannah Gutierrez read as the armor on rust fail Helena. It was her job to check the guns, check the bullets, and make sure that the set was safe. Yes. Even two and a half years later, her absence still catches me by surprise. Every time I go to a networking event, I still glance at the door, expecting Helena to walk in, her platinum blonde pixie cut perfectly coiffed, leather cuffs on her wrist, naturally cool with her signature adventures glint in her eye. At her funeral, I saw the house she never spent a single night in, the one she had bought just before coming to New Mexico. I almost called her after watching Dune part two to see what she thought of it and remember that she died before she was even able to watch part one. I wanted to tell her about the amazing experience I had on set a month and a half ago, about how much I had gelled with the director and the producer and was proud of the work I'd done. I haven't been able to make, bring myself to make Christmas cookies in the past two years. The thought of not seeing her weighing heavily on me. What's left of the film gels that were in the back of the car that first day we met are now in my living room. The last vestiges of her that I was able to salvage. Her 45th birthday was last week. I went to her grave instead of having dinner and celebrating with her. And while I feel her absence personally, the industry at large feels her loss deeply. I lost one of my best friends, but the industry lost a true visionary. We were robbed of all the images she had the ability to create, all the films she didn't shoot. Her son will grow up without his mother, her family continuing on without her. I know we can never get her back, but what I want is change and justice. I want those that had a hand in her death, either through action or inaction, to face the consequence, consequences of those decisions. This includes Hannah Gutierrez Reed. I ask the court to give her a sentence commensurate and fair to her actions in the role of the death of my dear friend Helena Hutchins. Holding Ms. Gutierrez Reed accountable will reverberate beyond just the sentencing. It reminds everyone in this industry that actions taken to compromise the safety of our workplace, yep. even if unintentionally, have serious consequences. Yes, it does. There are people that leave an indelible mark on your soul. That sends a very strong message. And that can message. never be erased. And the memory of her wit, her kindness, and her unwavering belief in me are permanently etched into mine. Yes, y'all, my face is leaking. She, she always have my back. not going to be any stopping it. And I promised her that I would always continue to have hers. Thank you. And you do. She did an incredible job for Whatever her bestie. I'd like to switch to uh, the Google Meet speakers. She did an incredible job showing up and speaking for her best friend. It was a very, very powerful statement. So, from the law nerds, ma'am, you spoke for your best friend and you had her back. And it was, um, I'm sure, incredibly difficult. But it was wonderful that she shared not only her okay, hopes great. for let's, what may change, uh, let's begin with, but beautiful uh, stories of her friend. Anek Rabini. That's Hannah's brother who keeps chewing his fingernails in the courtroom. And it looks like Hannah's mother is not there. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, my name is Anak Rabinal, and I thank oh. the court for this opportunity to speak about the impact of Helena's killing on me. I know I'm supposed to address the court today, but in writing this, it felt more appropriate to address my friend, 
colleague, creative partner, and playmate, as we never had the chance to say goodbye. Oh, woman, where do I even start? I'm having a flashback to helping you write your AFI application. At least then, you were there to talk it out and have a little bicker, as was our typical dynamic. Instead, it's just me alone, staring at a blank page, listening to silence. Why don't we start with the hard stuff first? The, the silence stuff is so hard after losing someone. The last couple of years. It's so hard. They say that death comes in threes. Within the space of a month in the fall of 2021, you were the third death of someone who had been fundamental <sighs> in shaping my adult understanding of myself in the world. As if you need me to come at you with more Hamlet in the afterlife. But it truly was when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. As I processed the reality of the news that had reached me, there were three thoughts that kept coming up. What a terrible, painful, scary way to die. Over and over again, I kept seeing you in my mind's eyes suffering needlessly, feeling you fight a battle that you were going to lose. But then I kept thinking, what's gonna happen to Andros? And then selfishly, how will we ever resolve our reconciliation? That August, when you remembered my birthday out of the blue, it was like maybe it's time to heal the two and a half year rift that had silenced a bond that had, for the majority of its decade long duration, oh. consisted of communicating almost daily. But then that wasn't possible anymore. You were gone. There were so many wonderful things that would never happen again indulging you in story time before bed during a shoot so that you could fall asleep on the phone while I drone on so you could dream of our brain baby. Who knew that was a weirdly us thing? Because you should see the faces of other <laughs> DPs when I ask them if they need a nighttime check-in. There will be no more hanging out in your kitchen, trying not to eat too many squirrels before going on some kind of adventure. Because who knew what the bathroom situation would be whilst random words, That's whilst fair. you teach me random words in Russian, and I'd watch you make cracked out Turkish coffee with all orange peel as pre-game fuel. The two of us always plotting how we would get something epic done with very little I money. I love this. I just love out this story. Tag team Thelma and Louise racket. It's Never always so hard that they I wait till the end. Plus one to some crazy inspirational thing where we'd be in full-on Lucy and Ethel mode, dead set on meeting the celebrity VIP who was in attendance. And usually we did. Because really, who could resist our wonder twin charms? I imagine there a few. There no more fraught existential conversations about what we were doing with our lives and careers, or any more big dreams, ideas cooked up together to be kicked down the road for when we'd have the resources and enough clout to do them. You and me, None of our ideas ever liked the small budget. Thank goodness we managed three times with what we had to push out some of our kids into the world. Almost every day, my Facebook memory speed reminds I, I me of some kind of with the trouble fingernails. we up to. I'm and sorry, y'all. We were manifesting into reality. Daily, it reminds me of the two people who are gone. You and the person you inspired and expected me to be as crazy making as you could be, because let's not gild the lily. Anyone who ever truly got to know you knew how stubborn, determined, and no holds barred you could get when you set your mind to something. And how diplomacy wasn't your way. Yet as crazy making as that could be, you would bring out the best of well, me. Well, if you have to get your vision Even across. Even if that involved breaking some eggs, so to speak, and you'd bring out the best of every gonna work. person you engaged with. Recent events have made me come to appreciate how with you, I didn't need a filter or to tone it down or to say it in a nice way. And the gift of being with someone who can accept the light and the dark in you is a rare, rare thing in this world. It's true. Even more rare is someone who is courageous enough to show up as authentically as you did. And here's the part that's easy, talking about what I admired in you, your courage and tenacity, I mean, you could spin your wheels in a neurotic frenzy, but when push came to shove, you would dig in, face your fears, and grab hold of your courage. That's Hannah's father. 
the felt. fact that you moved to a foreign country on your own as a young adult to pursue a dream is testament enough to your indomitable spirit, and it didn't stop there. You lived every single moment you had, and you never met a challenge you didn't give your best shot to. I admired your love of beauty and how you sought it out everywhere you looked. Maybe it came from having terrible eyesight when you were a kid, but you looked at the world with wonder and intensity. Your search for different ways of touching and feeling with your eyes and your inability to settle if something wasn't the way it should be was one of the commonalities that held us together and truth be told, the bedrock of trust that got us through the rockier patches because neither of us would let each other be less than our best. I admired your innocence of being. You approached everything with the ingenuity and insouciance of a child, and that takes guts in a world that continually tries to turn us into jaded, beaten down cynics. This is the short list of things that I loved and still love about you. With you gone, I find myself worrying about Andros, praying that he will have had enough of you and your vision to treasure the gift that was being born into this life with you as his mother. I still remember the day I visited you, him, and Matt after he was born thinking, shit, he's one brave bitch doing this motherhood thing. While your death is what one might call meaningless, as in it was wholly unnecessary and preventable, I pray that it will echo through time to ensure that its circumstances will not be repeated anywhere else and with anyone else. I pray that it will serve as a rallying point for the systemic change needed in an industry that sees the human beings who put their lives in service of it as dispensable cogs in a machine to serve bottom lines and shareholder expectations. You always fought the good fight, and your death will count for something more than this sadness and regret that it's left in its wake. Every one of us whose lives you touched owe you that. When I started writing this, I went to look back for that very first picture of the two of us together so that I could have something with you, something of you with me today. December 25th, 2011. It's funny to think in hindsight that we were the universe's Christmas present to each other. Our friends who introduced us were happy that we were both getting our starts in film and hoped it would be a good connection. Who knew that that Christmas would lead here? If only it had, it had led to what we both dreamt together. Being fabulous older ladies at some glamorous parties after being <laughs> awarded some big accolades and driving everyone around us crazy because we'd still be bickering and nitpicking on how we could have made the film better. So ready to be a fabulous older lady. I hear you. I miss you, my friend. I'm sorry we won't be able to say the things that needed to be said the apologies that needed to be exchanged. It's painful to know that we won't grow old together. All I know, all I can do now is promise you that I'll do my best to live up to being the person and artist you knew and wanted me to be and to do my utmost to uphold your legacy. And now I thank the court for permitting me this time to the share the impact of Polina's death on me and to ask it to do what it should to bring justice to the situation. Thank you. Ugh. The story is, it's so unfortunate they don't uh, get shared Odia? until Ocarina? the end. But yes, Hannah's father is a armor in the industry. He is sitting in the back of the courtroom. She keeps honor. looking his direction. I don't see the Ocarina mother in the courtroom. I immigrated to the US around the same time. Yes, we know Gloria Allred's there. Our, our Can we go to the victim? Fulfilled. From the moment we've met, she became more than a friend. She was my sister in every sense of the word. Helena was always there celebrating our victories and offering unwavering support. And during Olia, our her sister, does have a lawsuit against everybody involved in LA. I've been covering as that. As a too. mother, a talented cinematographer, and a successful woman, Helena juggled numerous responsibilities. Yet she always made time for her friends. Our daily hikes were not just about exercise, they were moments of solace and connection where Helena's words of encouragement lifted my spirits without fail. 
Together as female filmmakers, we confronted the obstacles of our industry. The Zoom is frozen, Finding it's not you. each other's company. Helena poured her heart into every project, infusing it, infusing it with generosity and kindness that left a lasting impact on everyone she worked with. Her presence on set was a beacon of light, creating joy wherever she went. She often overlooked her own needs, prioritizing others above herself. When Helena passed away, I was consumed by grief, feeling the loss of not only my closest friend, but also my greatest source of inspiration. Oh, this is not her sister. She represented hope for her a brighter future. Her sister's name is similar. That's my industry, apologies. Where creativity and kindness could thrive. Losing her meant losing a part of myself and a cherished creative collaborator. Though she may no now longer be watch. with us, Helena's legacy lives on in the hearts of all who knew her. We are committed to honoring her memory by continuing to champion the values she held dear, ensuring that her impact on the world will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Metz. The prosecutor did not say at the beginning how many impact statements there would be, so we're going to keep going through them. Um, as many as, as there are, I imagine there are no more in court or she would have mentioned it. Helena's family <clears throat> has okay. also uh, sued. Jen Her White. sister is not Olia, it's Olga. So apologies <clears throat> for that. And Gloria Allred is, uh, I think she's in court because she represents script supervisor, Mamie Mitchell, who was a witness. I don't know mm -hmm. why she would need to be there when it's streaming, but <clears throat> She has chosen to be there. It's impossible to put into words the devastation that I felt and will forever feel from the loss of my friend, Helena Hudgens, because mere words could never hold all of who she was or what she meant to me. It is absolutely indescribable, but I will try anyway. Two and a half years have passed and I still look for her. I still expect to see her. Grief is awful. I still wonder what adventure she's on and think about checking in. Then my heart drops through my feet and I have to face the reality that I will never see her or hug her or hear her laugh ever again. I will never get to feel that glow that she bathed everyone around her in. And I will never get to be there to celebrate what would have undoubtedly been many, many- Who's just walking around on Zoom? Helena Sorry. was a force. So distracted. She was complicated and talented and beautiful and caring and kind and funny and committed and charming and weird and fearless. She I'm was sorry, all of Jen. my favorite adjectives. We're very distracted. She inspired me. And I don't think she knew that because I never got to tell her. Carrie she looks was like one she's of my proud. favorite people in the world. Yep. I feel like she has gotten lost in the swarm of all of the finger pointing and blame in the aftermath of this completely preventable tragedy. Yep. The only way I have left to honor her is to do everything I can to make sure this never happens again and to try to make sure that the people responsible are held accountable. I've struggled to deal with this repeatedly being called an accident because it was not an accident. It was negligence and nothing else. Every single day there is gunplay on film sets carried out safely by qualified armorers. There are countless checks and balances to ensure safety for the cast and crew. And it seems every single one of them was ignored on this production. It does. There were multiple failures by multiple people, that is certain. And the actions of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed were the catalyst for Helena's death. By bringing live ammunition to set, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed set off a chain of events that could only lead to someone being killed. Which was ensured by her not properly checking the rounds. By her not leaving by her leaving guns and ammunition unattended, Bring by allowing the, the assistant director to take the gun from her, and by allowing her, by allowing Helena to be in the path of that bullet in the first place. Multiple breaches and protocol committed by the defendant made this inevitable, and it was only a matter of time. There's one absolute truth here. If Ms. Gutierrez Reed had properly done her job, Helena would still be alive. Absolutely. And Andrus would still have his mother. No matter what Baldwin did, if she had not brought live rounds onto that set, this Your Honor, couldn't have I beg you to impose a maximum sentence. It will not be and could never be enough of a punishment for the willful negligence committed by the defendant. 
that she needs to be held accountable for taking Helena's life and for destroying so many others. It doesn't seem to me or anyone that I've spoken to that Ms. Gutierrez Reed has ever demonstrated even the slightest bit of remorse for her actions and instead chooses to throw blame at everyone but herself. If prison time is the only way she will face any responsibility for what she has done, it should be for as long as the law allows. I hope the friends didn't see the because jail calls. Because the ripples of her negligence will never stop being felt by those of us who knew and loved her. Because they're bad. Thank you. Her friends have done an Thank excellent you. job. Making impact Joel statements Sousa. like this is incredibly... The other person was on that Metz, Stephen Metz. Oh, we oh, all okay. saw him. Uh, then let's go ahead and do uh, Mr. Metz instead of Mr. Souza. We'll do what we'll hear from Mr. Souza last. So two more. These statements are, oh, what is happening? Hold on. Let me refresh this. Um, impact statements are tremendously difficult to make. Where did the feed go? Oh, oh. Mr. Souza, we'll do what we'll hear yes, from Mr. Souza last. These are incredibly different difficult to make it is incredibly hard for the victims i don't understand why this uh this stream is doing this if we need to Susa, we'll, do, we'll, we'll hear from mr Susa last if we need to switch streams we will um let me look real quick add another stream because this stream but all the feeds are coming from one so i'm worried that if this feed is down the other feeds are also down all right, there we go. Nope. Um, give me one second, chat. I'm looking. Why is Joel Souza speaking? Because he had a close working relationship with the victim. Um, let's see. The cameras all feed out from one, so I am worried that if that one is down, others will also be down. Okay, they are not. All right. Give me one moment, and we will find where we were on this feed thanks chat live streaming is a uh, dynamic i don't know why that feed decided uh, to go down but Metz. oh okay uh, then let's go ahead and do uh, mr metz instead of mr Souza. we'll do what we'll hear from mr Souza last all right i did a quick bits on the jail calls and i will go back to the jail calls i always look for um hello a feed that doesn't um, have an obnoxious amount of stuff on the lower third. And uh, I just want to, I did prepare a statement, so I'm just going to read the statement off and then maybe have a little bit. He can. Uh, the death of Helena Hutchins has had a profound impact on me and my family. I was a very close friend of Helena and her family for many years. Our sons have been best friends since they were four years old. And Helena's husband, Matt, was one of my best friends. Helena and I would like <clears throat> would talk a lot about extreme sports. We spent time biking, riding, rock climbing. With our kids. Watching her son grieve uh, must she be was not very difficult. Working, which was quite a bit. Matt and I would hang out um, with the kids and let our kids play. They played together all the time uh, during the pandemic. It was really nice because Helena was not working for a good part of it, and we were able to spend a lot of time together. Uh, if you remember during the pandemic, there kids. were kind of these um, certain families that you could, pods. Uh, we, we called them a pod. So you could, um, you know, just, we kind of hung out with like just a very select and uh, very LA. Families, and the Hudson's family is one of them. Um, you would have gotten mm -hmm. to know each other quite so well. We would hang out in person. We wouldn't, you know, we didn't wear masks because they were considered, you know, our really close friends. Um, so uh, in, as far as the impact that, that I have seen so far, Matt was devastated when he lost the love of his life. Uh, I know how much he loved Helena. They were married for over 16 years, and they were a wonderful couple. Uh, the loss is devastating to everyone who knew them, uh, because it turns out, after everything is said and done, we've not only lost Helena, but we have also lost Matt. And we, we uh, basically, Matt has been affected, uh, trapped horribly by this, and of he moved away. So, um, basically, Matt died. Uh, when when Helena died, as far as we're concerned, meaning he moved away. He was somebody that I hung out with more than uh, once or twice a week on average. And uh, so in, in Helena's passing and in the negligence that I believe occurred on that set, uh, he didn't only kill 
or affect the ripples Selena, are vast. I know it goes without saying, but it still should be said. You affected many other families and people uh, around uh, Helena. So um, anyway, the loss of Helena has had a ripple effect on our whole community. She was a talented cinematographer, and she was loved by everyone who knew her. Her death is a reminder of the fragility of life. I imagine and, for and her husband being in L.A. would have been uh, That's an understatement. There's painful really no, reminders. Uh, there's no excuse. I mean, if you have a professional on the set, now I don't know all the protocol for, for film, that's not my field, but I do know that you have to take uh, gun safety extremely, you have to be handled uh, with yeah. extreme caution yeah. in every way. Yeah. And uh, I really feel that this was due to negligence. So uh, being that there are thousands and thousands of films being made all over the world, uh, this needs to set a precedent. This, this case needs to set a precedent for all of the other, uh, that somebody needs you know, to for be all held the other responsible. Whose lives and and cinematographers and everyone on the set really, whose lives are at risk with uh, when we have negligence in the in the hands of an armor or supposed armor. So um, anyway, it was a I like that he went to supposed uh, armor experience for uh, not just the Hutchins family but also for our family. My for son everyone. basically lost his really good friend. I, I, I honestly don't even know if they uh, really talk very much anymore. I, they used to talk almost every day and play video games together. And, uh, and it was a tragedy. So um, very, very sad. And that's my, that's the end of my statement. Thank you. Joel Souza. Stephen, can you? Yeah, thanks. Is Joel on Zoom? Me? Joel yes, had a lot to say at trial. Thank it's going you. to be interesting to see what he has to say now. I would now. like to thank the court as well as Ms. Morrissey and her team for allowing me to speak today. Joel's testimony made me cry. I what to say here today because what I want is simply not possible. I want that none of this ever happened, that everyone's yeah. okay and that lives weren't destroyed. He's like, I want to time travel. And that worst of all, and his life wasn't lost. Um... I would not presume to speak for Helena, nor for her husband or her son, for her parents or her sister, but I would like to say something on their behalf if I might. Uh, Helena's parents lost their daughter. Her sister lost a sibling and confidant. Matt lost his wife, the other half of himself. And Helena's son lost not only his mother, but everything she had to offer him for the rest of her life. Every kind word every loving gesture, every support, every influence, every life's lesson, the course of his life has been irrevocably altered. And the world lost not only a person that was a gifted artist, but a truly kind and compassionate person, which often seemed to be in short supply these days. Uh, as for myself, Joel, you're going to wreck us the all. last two and a half years are difficult to put into words. Um, what it's done to me and the burdens it's placed on me, both emotionally and physically, are my private burdens, and I think I'll choose to keep them that way today. What I will say is that one moment the world made sense, and the next moment it didn't, and it still doesn't, and I don't know if it ever will again. Um, so again, what I really want, I can't have. I want everyone damaged by Miss Reed's failures that day to find peace, I want this whole thing not to have been consumed by the world as some sick form of mass entertainment. I want to still believe in the better angels of our nature. I don't think everyone's consuming it that way, Joel. Away. I think people want to know what happened. I want to be who I was some before do. this happened. And above all, I want Helena to be back home with her husband and son in the house she never got to live in. <sighs> a lot of people uh, want to know how this happened. not only had an incredible talent for her art, but she had a talent for life. She was a touchstone for all who knew her. And those of us who were lucky enough to have shared in her fleeting time on this planet are better for it. Thank you. Thank you. I think Joel also uh, we knows. We have a, a brief written statement by one of Helena's uh, friends, Anya Bay, and that will be read by Alexander James. I think Joel is very mindful of the fact that he still has to testify against Baldwin in a few short months. We've already seen that his words have been brought up by Baldwin's attorneys and their statements and their filings. So I think he's very mindful of that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anya Bay. I'm a filmmaker in a very I'm gonna close- I'm going to just note here that this is very difficult 
for some attorneys, I always found it tremendously difficult. Reading first person victim impact statements into the record on court in court was always something that was tremendously difficult to do. Friend of Helena Hutchins. I so, want to apologize for not being able that to can. attend in person because of my last minute trip overseas, but I'm very grateful for the state for reading my statement. I've known Helena since 2014 when I first moved to LA. It was impossible not to connect and fall in love with her instantly, as she was that bright beam of light, creativity, and energy that could easily ignite the room, if not the entire city. Her passion for cinema was infectious. Her ability to enjoy life and love people around was evident. I felt very privileged to have her by my side, encouraging all of my endeavors. As my family lives far away, Helena became one of a few people that, firm, that formed my family circle in Los Angeles. We traveled and celebrated holidays together. We supported each other through thick and thin. And of course, we created beautiful films together. We were working side by side. Helena as a director of photography, and I was a writer slash producer. We collaborated on multiple amazing projects, questions. including our very first Save feature the, I'm, film, I'm which was almost questions. impossible to make. But not for Helena. She didn't believe in impossible. She was a fearless leader I with a unique the creative vision in. and deep appreciation for her career. No is not a no. It's and a I know that hundreds point. of people can back me up on that. She was a true inspiration. We had many more plans to realize and dreams to fulfill together. And it still doesn't sit with me that it's never going to happen. Helena was a very loving mother and wife, daughter and sister, friend and cinematographer. She was a cinematographer with the capital C, perhaps the most dedicated filmmaker I know, who would always go an extra mile, if not a hundred miles, only to take the best shot regardless of how hard it was. Just when finally, after all these years of hard work, she started to get recognized in Hollywood, which we all know could be very cruel and heartbreaking. This horrible turn of events during the production of Rust should have never happened. Agreed. Set safety should never be overlooked, or as in this case, completely Ignored. and utterly disregarded. Just especially when it comes to weapons. Safety was just yeeted out the window. I want to end with this. The tragic death of the incredible Helena Hutchins is not just a huge loss for her family, friends, and people that knew and loved her so much. It's a loss for the entire film community. <laughs> she deserved better. Thank you. And I think we Thank see you. that when they cut away to Thel uh, Reed. Gloria Allred will address the court on behalf of Helena's mother, father, and sister. Oh, Gloria is also representing the family. Wait, is she representing them in their civil lawsuit? I need the answer. I'm pulling this up now. Yes, she is. So Gloria Allred is representing Mimi Mitchell, but is also representing um, Olga Antonelli and Svetlana in their lawsuit against Russ Movie Productions, Alec Baldwin, Hannah, and everybody else. I've covered that in other content in talking about all the civil lawsuits because one of the ways to hold people responsible in cases like this is civil lawsuits. But that explains why Gloria Allred is there to make a statement for her clients. So she is there not on behalf of her client, Mamie Mitchell, but on behalf of her clients, the family of Helena Hutchins. Um, they had no, uh, no lack of smoke for everyone involved in this movie in their civil lawsuits. If all of you are also like red nosed and puffy and crying it, same, I mean, same. Um, there are times I get asked, Emily, would you ever be a judge? I can't, I can't sit through victim impact statements neutrally. Like I've, I used to be, I used to could, I can't anymore. I have, I have uncorked and there, there is no going back. Um, they're figuring out cameras. So we're going to do this. Chelsea, thank you for the super chat. Chelsea said, thank you for being classy and compassionate in your coverage today. I try to do that always. Good morning, Your Honor. Gloria, we're in the middle of talking about me. Hold on. These victim impact statements are beautiful and heartbreaking. They are. They make me wish I'd gotten to meet Helena. And they convince me 18 months is appropriate. The thing that's really hard about criminal cases is you do not often hear much about the victims until after all is said and done. And that is one of the things that is tremendously difficult in cases, though the prosecution talks a bit about uh, the victims, 
at the beginning, there's only so much you can do without it being prejudicial to the defendant's rights, and that can be frustrating too. Gloria, all red, all red, Morocco and Goldberg. Uh, and also uh, on behalf of my co-counsel. I can uh, see Carpenter. Hannah's face being like, why the fuck is she here? Carpenter and I understand. Zuckerman. Um, I would like to read a statement by Helena's mother, and then we have a video of her mother whose name is Olga Solovey, and she will be speaking in uh, Ukrainian, Russian, but we have English subtitles uh, for uh, Olga's statement. After that, I would like to read a very brief statement by uh, oh, the we're, sister. We're gonna be here Helena, a minute. Stefana okay. Zemko, who will also speak in Ukrainian, Russian, but we have English subtitles for her video. And finally, I do. I would uh, appreciate the indulgence of the court to we've, read a short statement of uh, Helena's father. We have just have no video. Turned over the court to Gloria. Okay. Uh, his name is Anatoly Andrusevich. Uh, and then I will conclude. I have some photos as well. Of, I'll do this when uh, we have a break. Parents yes. and sister with Helena. So thank you very much for your courtesy in oh, this matter. We're definitely going to be here a minute. Uh, this is a statement of Olga Solovey, Helena Hutchins' mother. Good afternoon. My name is Olga, and I am the mother of Helena. It is extremely difficult for me to speak about this. Helena was the best daughter on this earth. Okay, look, I'm I remember trying. how she graduated with the most excellent marks from two universities here in Ukraine. Even so, she left for the USA to study and pursue her dreams. She had a beautiful family, her son Andros. Just can't she imagine. She loved him madly and endlessly. All of her friends absolutely adored her. After this tragedy, my life has been split into two, before and after. I can't Time does imagine not heal. Losing a kid. It simply prolongs my pain and suffering. I have hope that the guilty, those that are responsible for the death of my daughter, will be punished fairly and sentenced justly. Justice must prevail. And I would like to say also that Olga and Svetlana made these videos despite the fact that where they live in Ukraine, in Kyiv, they are being bombed every single day. This is the video of Olga. Хаченко, мене звуть Ольга. Сьогодні я хотіла б вам розказати про свою доньку. яка була дуже талановита, гарна, дуже гарно вчилась, дуже добре до нас ставилась. Я пам'ятаю той день, коли її не стало. Мені дуже тяжко. Дуже тяжко без неї. О, oh, let me move me. Я не можу. Ой. Так. У університеті, потім вона Родила гарного хлопчика, мого внука, з яким я зараз не маю можливості бачити. Вона була дуже гарною матір'ю, але більше всього вона працювати любила. And for those of you that listen in the background, there are subtitles on the videos. If there's pauses, I'll try to read them. 
If I can. She said the day of her death ruined my entire life. It's heart-wrenching to see her child grow without his mother. She was a straight-A student in school and continued that excellence through university, through the universities she graduated from. Anyone who ever spoke about her spoke about her in only the greatest of terms. And up until now, this pain of loss does not end. She said I would visit them yearly and see how Andros was growing up. He looks a lot like my daughter. Helena really loved us all. She was always saying, Mommy, I want you to live better. She was always inviting us to stay with her. She wanted me to be beside her. But Svetlana but Svetlana, my younger daughter, was not old yeah, enough, and I couldn't leave her. So I promised her that as... I'm sorry, I missed that part. How, I promised her as soon as Sveta was older, I would make it. However, I didn't make it. Helena had many good friends who were always coming to visit us. She kept in contact with everybody and called us all. We would talk on the phone every week. It was usually on Saturday or Sunday, where we were talking for hours. I've never had a better friend than my Helena. She would share everything with me. She had a good family. However, that day turned everything upside down. It's extremely difficult without her. Every minute I wait until I meet her again. However, I gave myself my word that I would see Andres grow up and get an education, get married, make his own family, and I have to hang on. And then she said, I can't. When Helena died, it was 3 o'clock in the morning for us. And I couldn't fall asleep that night. I couldn't fall asleep till 3 until 3 because I felt some anxiousness inside of me. At 3 a.m. I saw Matt was calling. I was really scared because I knew something had to have happened. Because they never call me during the night. Yeah, you don't want to get those phone For a long time, he couldn't verbalize what happened. He only said, Mama, something horrible has happened. For five minutes, he couldn't tell me what happened. Finally, I broke and said, just tell me what happened. He said, Helena is no more. After that moment, I can't remember anything. I was home alone. I was screaming and I kept pleading with him, maybe this isn't the end, maybe something will get better. But he told me she is gone. It's the hardest thing to lose a child. 
and there's no words to describe, and time does not heal. It is two and a half years past, and it gets worse and worse. For the first year, I was still fooling myself into the hope that maybe she will still come to me. For the second year, I was trying to come to terms with what it really happened. But maybe I'm too weak. No, ma'am, you're not. But Helena would always say, Mom, you were so strong. But it doesn't work for me. I cannot be strong. I want to say that it will not get easier for me if someone will get punished or how many years the terms will carry. It's irrelevant to my pain. Well, those are the truest words ever spoken. However, it's very important to me that there is justice and that it prevails and that those who are guilty will be punished for the crimes that they committed. I wanted it for somebody to come up to me and express their condolences, simply look into my eyes, and I wanted to look into those people's eyes. Maybe that would make me feel a little bit better, and nobody ever came. I was at the funeral. I was coming this last year, but no one came but Helena's friends. It hurts that the people that are at fault have never tried to come to her mother. I cannot fathom everybody who is connected to Helena's death. No one has ever come to me to apologize. No one has expressed any sympathy. She was such a hard-working girl. She had every hour on her schedule. She loved her son. Their relationship is so close, she couldn't have enough of him. She called him every single day, which she would tell me, she would tell him stories about her work. And she was telling him good night every night. There was not a single day she would call him where she was away, when she was away from L.A. She would always laugh and be joyful and happy. And I was elated at the thought that everything was going her way and was working out for her. I believe she was happy in her family life. She wanted a baby girl. The first month I was there, the entire month, they wanted to cremate her in New Mexico, but I begged them not to. I wanted to say goodbye. They brought her body to Los Angeles. I said goodbye, and we picked her remains after two weeks. Her funeral was at Hollywood Forever, which is the center of the city, a beautiful place where films are shot. I mean, and shown, they have movie night at Hollywood Forever. There is a big stage, and a bunch of people gather there, they show films there. And she is next to her craft. 
вона рядом з сценою похована. Канал красивий. Там лебеди плавають. She is next to a lake with swans, an amazing place. Did who added the music to this? Stop it. Just let her statement speak for herself. Oh, just. I'm so I'm actually surprised the court allowed that. Oh, I've shifted to rage real quick. Sorry, y'all. Um, that's. I'm surprised the court allowed that. Honestly, that's a bit. The statement. I'd just like to add, Your Honor, that Olga is one of the most courageous. The statement was lovely. Women I have ever met. Ma'am, you don't in need. In addition to living in the war zone. To explain. Suffering the tragedy of her daughter. She is a nurse who cares for those. Who Are you making a statement now? Oh. Next. Gloria. Is, uh, you Svetlana know. You Zenko, know better than that. Helena's sister. And Helene and Svetlana says this. Oh, just let her words speak. As I gathered my thoughts to write this statement, I wanted to start by emphasizing an important memory. When my mother and I were building our homes in Kyiv, one of the most fundamental things we were dreaming of was how our entire family would gather together comfortably at this home with Helena. As it stands now, that will never happen again. I very much wanted for Helena to meet my children and my husband. Helena will never meet my baby boy who was born after her death. Her death has shattered my heart. She was not simply my sister. She was my friend and in a certain sense, my second mother. The video of Svetlana. I will do my best to read this one as well. As I've said, my track record with reading first-person victim impact statements is uh, not great. Uh, it's hard. It is uh, it's emotional. She says, I am the younger sister. She is the older than me. She was for me, in a sense, like my mama, and she helped raise me in my childhood. This whole family has the most stunning blue eyes. We had a lot of warm, kind, heartfelt stories and memories. When I was little, we would have these funny little competitions, fooling around, and with years that passed and we became older. Our age difference felt less and less noticeable, and from the motherly role she took, the role of my closest friend. We would have fun, hang out, go shopping together. She would make me feel like her equal, and I felt myself so grown up around her. She would take me everywhere with her. The time that was fun together was so interesting for me. Even if it was just for a walk, she would dress me up in her coolest clothes. She had such good fashion sense. She had such great taste. It was so touching. Oh, that was fast. She showed me what kindness and generosity looked like. She would never keep anything just for herself. She would even share with me the last piece of chocolate. She never took anything bigger or better for herself. She would always share it between us sisters. I was bragging to everyone about my sister. I would even joke and say, look how lazy I am. <laughs> And how hardworking she is. She worked for the two of us. She was really working so hard to get her dream accomplished. My sister was so cool. She was my friend, in a sense, my inspiration and a role model. At the times when I felt low, I would recall, I would recall my sister, who was always determined and strong. She was undeterred by any problems and would always go to reach, to reach her goal. She would inspire other people as well, and she would always lift me up. She was a person who was shining light around. 
Вона така взагалі була світла людина, і я навіть не можу сказати, що вона була я реалістично не можу назвати одну погану кваліті, яку вона мала. Ніяку жодної поганої або мінусової характеристики дати їй. Ну, ніяк, чесно. Не тому, що вона моя сестра, а просто вона така людина. Ну, вона була дуже крута. Сестра в мене, так, була дуже крута. Вона 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 мені багато чого пояснювала. І у плані виховання, мені здається, що вона навіть більше мені дала, аніж мама. Мені дуже важко про це казати. Це була моя така велика мрія, щоб ми збиралися з дітками. With our children, at least once or twice a year, we would gather all together around the big table, like the whole family, maybe before the Christmas time or some other holiday. That was my dream for the kids to all play together, for us to gather at this big table with a crackling fireplace. And be surrounded by the warmth of our love, and I understand now that it will never happen. I cannot. I just have to run away from it. It's... Мені треба, я не знаю, втікти. Фух. Короче. I really don't want to cry. It's one thing to talk about how great she was. But another to understand she's gone forever. Одне діло, коли ти говориш, яка вона класна, а друге діло, коли ти розумієш і все. I was trying to hold on to my emotions as best I could, but I cannot. Girls, I mean, same. Same. And this is your sister. And same. I cannot allow myself to cry because if I cry, I cannot imagine what will happen. I do not want for this situation to be taken as unpunished accident, like it just happened and it's gone. It's thrown in the wind. People should carry responsibilities for the things that they have done and for the effect that it has on others. I don't think it's the guilt of one person only. I think it's a collective guilt and responsibility for what has happened to her. We don't disagree. And that it's for the court to decide, but everyone who is legally responsible for her death, as evidence will show, each should take responsibility for their part, for their participation in it. What happened is not only that the life of one person that was taken, it's the psychological and physical health of the entire family. It's very fair, and I also understand her being able to talk about their delightful childhood and not being able to get forward from and this is the, the future that's lost. Of Anatoly Androsevich father of Helena Hutchins. The demise of my daughter Helena on the 21st of October 2021 became the tragedy and biggest bitter loss of my life, as well as the lives of my close loved ones. There is no way I can put into words to express the soul-crushing pain and suffering that I lived through every day. The constant state of stress, the turmoil of my soul, have drained my physical strength and caused an abrupt decline of my health with continued physical pain in my heart. Every day I remember Helena. I remember the moments of our lives. Since she was a child, my Helena was a very curious and adventurous hard-working, friendly, and caring person. At 11 years old, Helena convinced me to show her the nuclear submarine. We walked through each part of the nuclear submarine. As she grew up, it was her dream to make a documentary film about nuclear submarines with an emphasis on the threat of nuclear weapons for humanity. My Helena had a devoted and loving husband, Matthew. The stories a of her being fascinated as a kid are just And a profession she loved. In the most developed delightful. and democratic country, the USA. I could not have ever fathomed that her life would be endangered 
while she was at work. Filming a movie. As a former yeah. Marine officer, I fully understand the responsible and correct way to handle firearms. He's like, I know danger. I am confident. My daughter shouldn't have been in danger. That the death of my daughter was caused by systematic, gross violations of safety rules and regulations during filming of the movie Rust. I do not wish for revenge, but believe that each person responsible for the death of my Helena needs to carry the punishment that is equal to their guilt. Maybe, just maybe, this might prevent the same type of tragedies in the future to others and spare other parents from such a heart-wrenching catastrophe. And now I would like to show the court very quickly. For those asking, the all of these statements that are written are attached onto the record, but if it's read in court, the court reporter does have to type it unless there's an agreement that they'll just be attached to the record, but they will also be attached to the record. Uh, Ian, I see you in the chat. This Hi, friend. Honor, I thought that was her brother. It, could, it might be her boyfriend. I thought it was Helena her, her and brother. And Andros. Are you going to attach it for the record in a frame? Oh, can you? Ma'am. Can Elmo. Thank you. Gloria, unlock your Apple Watch. I can see the code. LA asked, are children allowed to give impact statements if they wanted to? Yes, they are allowed to. However, um, they can also be provided by written statements. It really depends on the kid and whether it would be helpful for them or more harmful for them but they can also submit written statements that are not read out loud. Her husband can submit written statements that are just submitted to the court for the court to read and not read out loud. So it really, it depends, but yes, they are allowed to make impact statements. And the defense submitted a ton of letters. Some were mailed to the court. So we will see what happens next. The court is putting up photos of thank you the next photo helena, is a her photo son of Svetlana and her mother and helena for those asking gloria does not represent helena's husband that's helena and her sister wearing the uh, leather the leather cuffs that her friend was talking about on her wrist the last photo your honor and is anatoly and his grandson andros Yeah, I summarized the defense letters. I didn't read them all in. They also attached them to Thank the public you. record with all of the phone numbers and addresses. And I, in them, I which I mentioned. You think Bowles would be this week, April 9th. Sensitive to was would have been Helena's 45th birthday in honor of her birthday. Uh, our law firms have placed flowers on her grave. OK, thanks, Gloria. Forever. I May she rest in peace. Ma'am. Thank you. Ma Thank you. There, are t <clears throat> there are times you, when it's just like, OK, uh, stop brief, that. Uh, five minute slideshow, and that will, that will conclude the state's presentation. I don't know what slideshow they're doing. Gloria is not an elected official. She is a high profile attorney who does both, well, mostly civil cases, but has done some criminal oh, yeah. cases. She also does victims representation. Why won't this go into? However, there is always a moment uh, that will be taken in an all red case. Well, the prosecution is yet again figuring out how to use the tech and giving everyone a chance to like suck all of the liquid back into their face and take a moment. I'm going to try to um, answer some questions and thank those of you that have gifted memberships. Uh, Millie, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Um, J. Michael, I saw the gifted memberships. Wait, where did they go? There, some of the things didn't get saved, some did. Vicki Thomas, thank you for the memberships. Fiona W., thank you for the memberships. 
J. Michael RN, good to see you. Thank you for the 20 gifted memberships. Um, thank you, thank you. Elizabeth said, I noticed on the Bowles last motion that he was listed as Bowles Law Firm, not the partnership with the sidelined attorney. That's very interesting. I will take a look and see if they had been at the same firm or uh, Bowles and Bouillon, um, or if they had just been listed as co-counsel. I didn't okay. notice, but um, Elizabeth, I, I will look to... at that. That's a very interesting observation. It's a different way. Um, tech. Uh, Smurfette why echoed what we... Lot said in the chat. I'm crying. Why isn't Hannah? I don't know how you sit Let there. See what the best way is. I don't know how you sit there. Even Bowles and the prosecutor both did a very good job um, of, of sitting there. But even at moments, the prosecutor was looking down and dabbing her eyes. I don't know why she's approaching. I'm going to get to some more questions as we're doing this. Tinsley, good to see you. Tinsley said, I hope in hearing all of this, the real heartbreak, Hannah fully accepts responsibility. Uh, no appeals. She's probably going to appeal do her time and dedicate herself to and dedicate to being her best self if not for her for helena she owes her that and i think what we're seeing with uh thel's sorrow in court which again thel is hannah's father he's a legendary armor in the film industry but also it seems that he loves the movie industry this is heartbreaking for everyone within the industry because it just never should have happened the people around you who are responsible to do their job should do their job, and this doesn't happen. This is the uh, paralegal that was telling Hannah she could say whatever she wants at sentencing and that um, she'll only get a few more days in jail, so it's like, whatevs. Also, the paralegal that said, I hope that bitch, the prosecutor, isn't recording these calls, but it seemed that the paralegal was not calling on the attorney calls, so they were recorded. Uh, Rob says, what do you think she'll get? I think she will probably get custody time I'm very interested to see um, what the defense argues. J. Michael said, here's another 20 to celebrate my promotion. Congratulations on your promotion. Chat, thank Michael for the memberships and congratulate him on his promotion. Susan said, uh, gifted five memberships. Thank you. LA, are the children, oh, we, we answered whether children are allowed to speak. Syracuse asked about the court reporters. So you can see it. Depends on jurisdiction. That work for that camera and don't forget when you're L buddy you six, six. Thank you for the okay. gifted memberships. Um, Emily, she is worth your tears. Something I learned when I lost my son. Tears can be a tribute. Never apologize. And then I try not to just sit on the internet and cry, but I cannot, I cannot help okay. it when it comes to victim impact statements. It's, it, it's just, there, should have just gone to work and been safe, right? Marjorie said, Emily, can you explain our jail our jail calls routinely recorded? Yes, all jail calls. Was Hannah made aware of the lack of confidentiality? I already hate the music. Yes, every jail call says, and if you go back and watch my episodes covering um, other cases, you'll hear at the beginning there's a recording that lets you know it's being recorded. I hate the music bring the copyright strikes. Again, the music is appropriate for a funeral. I do not love it for a victim impact presentation at all. Some courts would not allow this. Courts courts I courts that I practiced in would not allow it. It's Pink Floyd Wish You Were Here, which might be a song that Helena loves. Again, appropriate for a funeral. My jurisdiction would not allow it at a victim impacts uh, presentation. But every jurisdiction is different. I am but one prosecutor. And um, I am but one prosecutor. I'm going to, again, turn this down just a little bit because, um, well, the copyright of it all is going to be an issue. And we will go, we will go through this. Um, anyone else who works in court, let me, let me know. Um, because it's a, it's an odd thing for me. Uh, the photos again are, are lovely and appropriate, but it's, uh, it's a lot. And I think knowing the victim and, and seeing her at work and showing the photos of her doing her work are very important. It just, the music is a bit um, heavy handed in court. That's my personal feeling. So you guys let me know. But 
the photos completely appropriate and lovely. So let us, I'm going to answer some questions while we are watching the slideshow with um, Helena, her work, photos of her doing her work. Um, because again, that is absolutely appropriate to, um, to remind the court what the cost is of this case. So let's continue. Um, Diane said some people can't cry. HDR looks sad and remorseful. Um, I, I am open to all, all perspectives, um, of, of Hannah's demeanor in court. I think she looks a little sick to her stomach as this all becomes a reality, but you know, fair, fair is fair. Lauren said there was a slideshow with music picks and videos during Leticia Staunch's, Staunch's sentencing too. Again, jurisdictions vary, prosecutors vary. My feelings on the thing are very much informed by where I worked and how I worked. So that, um, that is part of it. So thank you guys. I'm going to get through as many questions as I can while the slideshow is playing. The prosecutor said that she could get additional charges for hiding a gun in the bar. What sentence could she get for that? I haven't gone through the um, charge, the additional weapons charge she's been indicted on. Um, I haven't gone through it yet, but that case is pending actively. I love Pi. Who did Gloria represent before? I know the name. I just can't remember who she represented. In this case, Mamie Mitchell, the script supervisor, she is also representing her. Brandy Rose said, did you see the video of the judge that walked off the bench during a proffer? I did not see that. Um, we might do that for a members only live. Um, Happy at Heart asked, is Joel completely blameless? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. I think it's a matter of perspective about as the director, how much he could have or should have jumped in if he observed Hannah being reckless and where he might have been able to jump in um, on that as the director of the film or if he could have interceded with Baldwin. And Baldwin's, um, no, we're not done yet. If he could have interceded with Baldwin and and checked Baldwin if others couldn't have. Nef, uh, Nefula said, I'm late, so it may have been addressed, but I get the feeling that Hannah Gutierrez seems emotional only because she knows she's screwed. Again, I, I think it's open to interpretation, but I'm sure her attorneys told her not to hold back uh, emoting in this. She's also probably going to make a statement and she's going to have to express some remorse to this court. Elliot JN said, this is why I maintain 18 months is not enough. Not sure if that would be possible. Can the judge go over 18 months? No, 18 months is the max. It looks like we're at the end. 18 months is the max. The judge cannot go over the maximum statutory sentence. I mean, we're still not at the end of, I, I don't know how long that is going to go on. Um, there we go. Karate Cat Mom said, is was Joel involved with the completion of the movie? Yes, he talked about it a bit in his testimony too, that he felt that it was a tribute to Helena to finish her work. Um, her husband also was signed on as a producer. Mr. Walsh. To finishing the movie. We are now moving to the defense Your statement. Reed has a statement. She'd like to tell the All group. right, chat, buckle up. As Hannah makes a statement on her own behalf, the defense is asking that her case be dismissed after probation. <clears throat> the prosecution wants her to go to prison. First and foremost, my heart aches for the Hutchins family and friends and colleagues as well. And it has since the day this tragedy occurred. Helena has been and always will be an inspiration to me. I understand she was taken too soon, and I pray that you all find peace. I am beyond grateful that Joel survived that terrible day. My heart goes out to the film industry for the devastating pain that this tragedy caused and the old wounds that have been reopened. I am saddened by the way the media sensationalized our traumatic tragedy and portrayed me as a complete monster, which has actually been the total opposite of what's been in my heart. Oh, God. Your Honor. You're 30 when seconds I took in. Rust, I was young about you. and I was naive, but I took my job as seriously as I knew how to, despite not having proper time, resources, and staff. 
Look at the judge's face. Also, she has shifted immediately to what went wrong on the set. Look at the judge's face. I was young and I was naive, but I took my job as seriously as I knew how to. Despite not having proper time, resources, and staffing, when things got tough, I just did my best to handle it. Today, I humbly ask you to consider probation, a probation where I can contribute to society through community service, and I can continue my counseling, and I welcome any classes that you may deem necessary for me to attend. I give you my word now that I would strictly follow the rules and respect the parameters of that probation. I beg you, please don't give me more time. The jury has found me in part at fault for this god-awful tragedy, but that doesn't make me a monster. That makes me human. Thank you. That's it? Then and I believe Phil Reed would like to speak to the court this time. Oh. Um, I didn't hear her say sorry. Did I miss it, chat? Did I miss where she said, I, anything, anything like sorry, or I should have checked the weapons more, or I regret you, that honor. day every day in my life? Brief state, but uh, it's a horrible tragedy for that wonderful lady, lady to lose her life. Also be a tragedy to put my daughter, Hannah, in the penitentiary for that. She led, she brought, uh, introduced live ammunition on the set. That's not true. Fellow's saying it's alleged she, I'm going to gain this up. Her father is saying it's alleged she brought live ammo on the set, and that's not true. Would she? The two people responsible I'm going to back that up a little bit because he's talking very, very quickly and very softly. But, uh, sir? Well, tragedy for that wonderful lady. Lady to lose her life. Also be a tragedy to put my daughter, Hannah, in the penitentiary for that. It's alleged she brought, uh, introduced live ammunition on the set. That's not true. Why would she? The two people responsible for whatever come on the set are the vendor and the property master who had to work for her. On that terrible day, they had Hannah off the set doing prop duties, and she asked him to please bring her back on when Mr. Baldwin comes so he could do a final check on the gun and its instructions. They, they, they did not do that. If they had it, this horrible day would not have it. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the court. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And, and just briefly, Judge, I've, I've made most of my arguments in the written pleadings. And Judge, it's uh, nobody in this courtroom could not be moved by what we just saw. The family, um, Helena's family, her friends, uh, it was a horrible tragedy. Um, there's no doubt about that. And it's a tragedy for everybody. There were a uh, number of lives changed, lost um, that day. Her friends talked about that. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez. I, I didn't realize we had gotten to argument yet. The court didn't seem to ask for argument. Um, uh, but here we are. Like, he, here we are. I, I just want the court to know primarily that she has felt remorse. Bulls! She just had a chance to say whatever she wanted to the court, sir. You can't get up and say the things that she didn't say. You are not the one pulling the puppet strings. She should have said that, not you. And maybe I've talked to her as much as, as anybody, at least on the legal side, Ms. Cisneros. She's cried. She's broken down. She's had mental breakdowns. She said, if only, many, many, many times. And she's, it hasn't come out. It hasn't come out until today because of the legal proceedings and the system we have. But she has truly felt remorse. And I will she tell the court that. She could have said that, that Bowles. As an officer of the court, that she has indicated that to me. This court has seen jail calls she's made. I, I would submit to this court that uh -huh. you could probably survey 100 people after something like this happens. Uh... Other people saying shit in their jail calls is not relevant to the shit your client said in her jail calls. Okay, sorry, we flipped the switch back into uh, anger for me. Including everybody that participated in the trial, scrutinize all of our calls and 
pick out something bad that one of us said. Because, Your Honor, none of us are what we are on our best day. Are you saying that the judge has paid off? Nor are we what we are on our worst day. And as Ms. Gutierrez said, she, she's human. She's flawed just like everybody else in this courtroom. We asked this court to consider um, fairness uh, in respect that this was a cascade of tragedy. The court's going to say fairness uh, and some that of the somebody speakers died. Indicated, uh, there were multiple system failures uh, by multiple people. Agreed. Some of those people have come before the court, as this court knows, and, and received uh, six-month misdemeanor probation. Uh, some have not been punished. Some have yet to here. come before the court. Um, at least one individual is going to be tried in July. And so yep. I know this court has the responsibility to weigh all of that and to determine what is commensurate and fair, as one speaker said, for Ms. Gutierrez. And what, what does that mean in the scope of things and what, what has come before this court? And I'm asking the court to consider that. And also what probation might do for her in terms of rehabilitation, which is another goal of our system, Your Honor. He didn't mention conditional discharge once. No, Your Honor. I'm going to put up a poll real quick. I'm going to pause this so I can put up a poll. Um, I'm asking you what you want to see. Um, Remember the conditional sentence with probation with suspended uh, sentence and conditional discharge. A conditional discharge means she would do probation, and if she completes it, she would have no record of this. Uh, I'm asking what you want to see. Prison, probation with a suspended sentence, conditional discharge. Conditional discharge means she would have no record after she completes probation, if she completes it successfully, there would be no, um, there would be no conviction shown. It would be uh, removed. So let's keep going. I'm asking you what you want to see happen uh, in this case. As we get right, to so the I've sentencing. Made some notes along the way. So if I refer to the notes and I'm not looking at tape. I'm gonna gain this up just a little bit. We're a little bit behind time, so no spoilers in the chat. Please and thank you. I want to hear what this judge has to say. It's because I'm reading. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentations. Thank um, the friends and family of Helena uh, for presenting uh, their memories and their losses of Helena. There are really three choices for sentencing before me. Um, what the defense wants is a conditional discharge. This means straight probation, unless Ms. Reed, Ms. Gutierrez comes back on a probation violation. She won't have a felony conviction on her record, so she can continue to possess firearms. Yeah, I don't think Again, the court's unless inclined. she comes back on a probation violation and receives the imposition of the probated sentence. Yeah, I don't think the court's inclined to do that. The second one has not been offered by counsel, but uh, I've certainly thought of it, and it's uh, to continue her in the Santa Fe County Detention Center, that would be for 12 months. That's all she's allowed to stay at the detention center. So a and year county jail. And then put her on jail. probation for the rest of the time. She's facing eight. She could do, uh, ironically, they generally, well, in my jurisdiction, call it a bullet, um, which is a one-year sentence in jail. You don't get transferred out to prison. You do the one-year sentence in county jail and then get out on uh, probation 18 months she's got pre-sentence confinement for about a month or so um, in, in this scenario she won't experience prison she will be a convicted felon she cannot carry a firearm under federal law Which and I for a specific time under New Mexico is what the law. judge is interested in is that weapons restriction and then there's prison and uh, the state has proposed at 85 percent of the time uh, sentenced to incarceration based on serious the, and violent uh, serious violent offense statute and 85 percent would for all the fanfare and pundits and finger pointing that has been going on for over two years we were able to seat a jury of her peers who confirmed that they could listen to the evidence received in court and determine the facts and apply the law they found Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter quickly what were some of the poignant facts that came out during the trial? In her police interview, she proudly owned her position as armorer. On October 21st, 2021, 
Chaos ended after the film crew walked off. Ms. Hutchins and others were trying to rig, if you will, how they were going to keep filming. And what was the defendant doing while waiting? She was loading Alec Baldwin's gun. Did she have enough time to load the weapon safely? Plenty. Did she load the weapon? Yes. With dummies in a live round. Did she check what she was loading? No. Why? Well, in her own words, most recently, in her jailhouse calls, she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time. Oh, she's done. She's absolutely done. She's absolutely done. Did she check after that? No. Absolutely done. And while you've heard her concerns about how she'll never work again as an armorer leading up to the trial, have her concerns changed? No. Once the judge brings up the jail calls, she she's done. Oh, dear. This whole thing has been a character attack on her. Just recently in her allocution, I'm not a monster. I'm going to see if I can gain the judge up a little bit, Chad. I know we're a little behind time. Um, no spoilers in the chat. Thank you. Um, the judge quoting her jail calls is not good for Hannah. Have her concerns changed? No. Here's what she says. This whole thing has been a character attack on her. Just recently in her allocution, I'm oh, not a monster. the judge is pissed. And what did... Oh, where is it? Uh, they talk about how much of Han on the phone. They're talk. She and another are talking about how much of changed. Hannah's life they, uh, they could take up, and that this is messing up her modeling career. This is while she's incarcerated, waiting for a sentence. And what does she say about the death of Helena? Hannah is dismissive of the judge talking about someone dying as a result of her actions. Oh, big mad. Hannah says she's looking at 13 months, which is ridiculous over what happened. Big man. Hannah says that people have accidents and people die. It's an unfortunate part of life, but it doesn't mean she should be in jail. I've never heard the judge have this tone. A conditional discharge is not appropriate. And the second option of leaving you in the detention center would be giving you a pass you do not deserve. Oh, done. I did not hear you take accountability in your allocution. Done. You said you were sorry. You were sorry, but not you were sorry for what you did. You were sorry for and hope they can find peace. It was your attorney that had to tell the court that you were remorseful. The judge is staring at Hannah in this courtroom. Remorse, a deep regret coming from a sense of guilt for past wrongs. That's not you. Well, there's the book. It's going to start flying off the You're bench. Here by sentences follow stand. 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 <laughs> I am sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. And there you go. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. 85%. It was committed in a physically violent manner. A fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Miss Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. Take her, the, the judge, just. I'm going to ask the I'm deputies to watch done. while the courtroom gets cleared. Her mother Please was. Do an order of remand to the, transport order to the Department of Corrections. Transport to the prison. And the judgment and sentence. Her mother was not allowed in the courtroom today. We are um, in recess. The, all right. They're asking all the deputies to make sure that the courtroom gets appropriately cleared. I hope that we don't see a victory lap press conference from the prosecutors like we did after the Murdoch trial. The judge, you could start to hear her getting madder. Once the judge said jail calls, I was like, and done. Um... And I think the jail calls are what did her in for the serious and violent designation. I really do. This is a involuntary manslaughter. I still don't know how I feel about the serious and violent designation, but it designates it as an 85% crime, which means she is going to spend more time in custody. 
Um, Rob, good to see you. Wait, I meant to pull your statement up and then I, I was going to read it and then the chat jumped because there's like 26,000 of you here and then I lost it. Sorry, Rob. Uh, wait, uh, ah. I think Rob said, well, uh, wow, yep, there you have it. Sounds kind of like Runkle was saying um, throughout the trial, the judge was not having it. The judge was absolutely not having it. Uh, Miguelina, if you will look and see if there were any press conferences, I don't think there are, but if there are, um, we will go take a look for them. I think at the end of court, we are done. Um, so if you will take a look and see if there's any, but the sentence was pronounced pretty quickly after all of the statements given. I'm gonna answer questions and uh, we will go through what happened and do a quick recap. But for all of you that are new here, I'm gonna just say hello, uh, new law nerds, welcome. Good to see you. Um, I cover live court. I do court breakdowns. I was a trial attorney for a very long time. If you would like to stay in the loop, we've got a very fluid and busy week. Lawnerdapp.com is my free app. It's in the app store um, for iOS and Android. It will keep you in the loop about the trial schedule this week. I'm gonna give you a quick scheduling before we get into Q&A and chatting about the sentencing and the rest of it. This week, there is a very contentious trial, very high profile trial, starting jury selection that has nothing to do with politics. And that is the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed in Massachusetts. The judge has indicated they are going to do independent voir dire, juror by juror. And if that is the case, I don't know when jury selection will end, but when it does, we will start coverage of that trial with opening statement. This week's podcast on Wednesday will be a summary or an overview of what's going on in that case. To give you a brief, the state says this, the defense says this, I have all the questions so we can go into that trial with a little bit of a um, foundation for the vast differences between the state's perspective of the case and the defense perspective of the case. And when I say vast differences, there are vast differences. Also, the lead defense attorney is a prior LA County Deputy District Attorney. He is a very good trial attorney. I will be very interested to see how this trial goes. There's also local counsel um, in Massachusetts there. It is, there's a federal investigation ongoing while the state case is ongoing. It is a very interesting case. The defendant is out of custody, accused of killing her boyfriend. So we will be covering that when it starts tomorrow. There will be some timing blips as I summarize the TikTok psychics court hearing on the motions for summary judgment. And then I will be, I think, going over Kevin Frankie's latest lawsuits and others. So we will be doing that. Uh, but before we go to questions, Miguelina, my amazing producer, thank you, is letting me know, and I'm sure the mods also help find this because our mods are the best, that um, there is, in fact, a prosecution press conference happening right now. So we are going to go to the press conference before we get to Q&A. Am I interested to see what the prosecutor has to say? Sure am. Um, do I think it's wise for the prosecutor to be talking to the media uh, at the moment? Well, we'll see what she has to say, and then I'll give you my thoughts on that. So we are going to go to that press conference. It looks like it just started literally like two minutes ago. So we are going to zoom, zoom into court, or well, out in front of court to do that press conference. Miguelina, again, thank you. Um, this judge is not having any of any of this literally at all. Um, let's zoom, zoom. I'm sure the, uh, we're going to start in just a minute. This was Mr. Bowles walking out with his paralegal. I don't know if we're going to hear from them. Uh, we might, they're going to say, uh, you know, we disagree with the sentence well, we and there will be an appeal. I'm sure. All right. I'm going to gain this up just a little bit. Thank you, Miguelina, again, for finding the press conference. Very much appreciated. Um, well, we... I'm going to gain that up even more because that's not going to... All right. They're all just walking out of court yeah, with their stuff going to their cars. Uh, we certainly respect the judge's decision. It's been a... That's still quiet. Can we, can we do any more? Let's just max all. Sorry, you guys. It is as loud as I can get it difficult case and a, a hard-fought case. Um, it's unfortunate um, 
that uh, that it had to um, end this way. Um, but uh, taking responsibility, I think, is uh, critical um, in the uh, criminal justice system. Yes, it is. And that was something that unfortunately uh, was lacking uh, from Ms. Gutierrez. Um, so we, um, uh, again, we respect the court's decision and uh, we hope that this brings uh, some, some peace to uh, Ms. Hutchins' family. Thank you. How much of a role do you think the jail phone call played in this sentence? I can tell you that they- A lot. I can tell you those jail calls played a lot of a role in showing not only that Hannah didn't have remorse, but in Carrie Morrissey's perspective of this case, she said at the beginning that she wasn't sure what she was gonna ask for until she saw those jail calls. So it changed everything. They, they played a, a, a very big role in my recommendation. I don't know uh, how much of a role they played for the court. The judge quoted them. You know, I, I wouldn't wanna comment. The reporter asked, does this sentencing impact the Baldwin trial, which I see a lot of you asking. I'm interested to see what Carrie has to say, but I will give you my thoughts on that when we get to Q&A. The cases are very different. Uh, I think that sentencing is something that's um, to a certain degree individual. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't say that this is um, uh, anything reflective of what may happen in that case. It's a signal. She's saying, the reporter's saying with regard to the jail calls, you're saying it's made a big impact on your recommendation. That's what you spoke about when you first got up there. When you heard those calls, you mentioned 200 calls, what went through your mind? Compassion fatigue. Um, you know, we, uh, we have the, the... I think what Carrie is saying is she had compassion for Hannah Gutierrez because of all of the circumstances and the jail calls just all of a sudden it drains and there we go. Compassion fatigue. She's like, and we're done. I will recap the jail calls uh, during Q&A because we've only been streaming State for like has, two hours. Why not? Uh, has, uh, we got time. Has approached this prosecution... Um, from a standpoint of compassion for Ms. Gutierrez, for her age, for her lack of experience. Um, and uh, my compassion came to an end. <laughs> yep. I was not. Do you have any reaction to her statement that she just spoke? No, I don't. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> Carrie's, Carrie's no, I don't says it all. I missed one question. So I'm gonna back up and see if I can hear it. But Carrie's, mm, no, I don't, is kind of a statement, isn't it? Gutierrez for her age, for her lack of experience. Um, and uh, my compassion came to an end. With that you surprised the judge gave her the full she, the question was, are you surprised that the judge gave her the maximum? Remember, 18 months is the most Hannah Gutierrez could have gotten. I was not. No, I don't. That says it Thank all, you. doesn't it? You guys. Carrie's like, nah, I don't. Because again, anything Carrie says to the media is going to be a problem in the Baldwin case and in other cases. She really, uh, oh, and Gloria Allred is coming to the mic. Anyone surprised? No? How are you? I'm sorry, are you no, no. Speak? no, no, I'm not. Oh, okay. Who else was walking up? I do love a wheelie box. I, I always had a wheelie box um, for court. Love a wheelie box. Didn't didn't roll uh, to court with a Chanel purse though. I can I can assure you of that. Okay, I have some things. You have some things. She's like, there's no podium. It's windy. We'll see what she has to say. Um, I, I mean, I'm not surprised that she's giving a statement. I, she's made a. I have some things to give you. Oh, she has. She she brought enough for the class. Um, this is a statement of Olga that I read. If you would like a copy, can we pass these around? 
I'm also waiting for the papers to blow away. I love that she's looking at the media going, here, can you hand these out? Um, can you hand these out to everyone? I brought enough for each of you. Thank you. Okay. And also pass around the statement of Svetlana. Yikes. I don't know which member of the press offered to help her, but somebody offered to help her. But Gloria's like, I brought written statements for all of you. Okay. It's windy. It is windy. All right, thank you. That's it. If you would like a video that was shown in court, I will give you a thumb drive. Who is she handing out thumb drives to? Okay. Oh, she brought a bunch of thumb drives. So the media can re-air the video. I don't have enough for everybody, but I will give you- Why don't you just give them to the pool? Give them to the pool so producer and the pool producer can just make them available. Not me, not Emily. This isn't your problem to solve. Not your circus girl. This is a thumb drive. It's she brought a bunch of thumb drives. I'm from channel seven here locally. <laughs> the media is like, might I have a thumb drive? Yes, give it to court TV. They're the pool and they can probably make it available. Christina, thank you for the uh, memberships. Thank you. The media will figure out how to get them to each other. She's like, Univision. She's like, they're not in Spanish. She's like, I don't care. Can we have a copy? Channel 13. Anyone else that didn't get? <laughs> Sorry, Channel 13. She's like, anyone more important? Gloria. The prosecutor showed a bit of humility in this moment. That's the last one I have. So anyone else, I'll give you my email. I'll give you my email. Same judge is covering the Baldwin trial. Um, Petit, I did discuss the jail calls in Quick Bits this morning. It's on the podcast feed and on the Quick Bits channel, but I will cover them again after this if we have time. Um, Megan said 18 months is a light sentence. It is the maximum the law allows for an involuntary manslaughter in New Mexico. So it is a maximum sentence. Whether you agree with the law being the maximum sentence or not is completely up for conversation. But getting the max with no prior record is unusual. Okay. Um, I'm um, happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to answer any questions, she says. Will Hannah's conviction as a felon follow her forever as far as ever possessing or buying a firearm? What the judge said is it is a federal firearm ban, but the laws vary in New Mexico, but there will be a substantial firearm ban, which the judge seemed very interested in. I can't gain this sound up anymore. We'll just see what happens with Gloria answering questions. What do you think of the sentencing? What do you think of the sentencing? She was asked. And yes, Baldwin Emily is the same judge. did not express what they think specifically the sentence should be, but they trusted the court to give the sentence that the court believed was just. I think clearly the sentence. Good to see you, Stephen. The maximum of 18 months. And this is that this was a serious offender and a serious offense was appropriate. I do not think the other two options that the court suggested were possible options, were options that should have been uh, exercised by the court. Probation clearly inadequate. Yeah. And even just serving the remainder of 12 months in county custody, in jail rather than prison would not have been appropriate. I, I do think the prosecution did an excellent job in proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And we're looking forward to the next case. What do you think this means for this next case when you're looking at trying to they're all, justice? They're all talking about Baldwin. What does this mean? 
for Baldwin's case is the question. I'm expecting a jury that's going to give a fair trial, not only to the defendant, but also to Helena Hutchins. May she rest in peace. Okay, good. Anything else? Whatever happens, it's not going to bring Helena back, but definitely, as the family has said, everyone who's responsible should have to face the consequences and be accountable. Do you believe Alex Baldwin was part of that cascade of negligence that people talked about? The reporter's asking about the cascade of negligence. We support the prosecution of Alec Baldwin. Well, you have multiple clients suing Alec Baldwin. Was there a restatement that stood out to you, considering we haven't heard from her until today? The question was, is there anything from Hannah's statement that stands out to you? Nothing about the statement that Hannah Gutierrez gave in court today changed the fact that she should have to pay the ultimate price, which is possible under the law. Yeah, well, Hannah's not going to pay the ultimate price. Helena paid the ultimate price. What blows my mind, absolutely just I cannot wrap my head around, is that after listening to Helena's mother's statement that Hannah didn't stand up and say, and to Helena's mother and her sister and her husband and her son, I failed you. Everyone on this film set failed you. And I am so sorry. I am so sorry for your loss. I am so sorry for what happened. How do you watch her mother's statement talking about no one apologizing to them and then saying nothing? It, I, I, it just... I don't know if it would have changed anything, but I don't understand how you don't, I, I, I just don't understand. But also sitting in a courtroom um, after you've been convicted by a jury, getting ready to go to prison, I don't know how much she is perceiving what's going on around her and how she's able to process it, or if she's just in full freeze mode. I don't know. They asked, how would you describe the judge's comments? Do we need a reiteration of the judge's comments? I think the judge was very clear yep. about the factual basis that supported her conclusion that the judge does have to make a record of that option should be the one that she handed down. Gloria's handling the wind well. Explained why that was appropriate. They're asking if this is the same judge for Baldwin. It's going to be a different jury. Perhaps the same judge, but Gloria's like I don't know. That's a very, a very uh, still be a fair trial. A very uh, gracious way of saying I don't know. And I know Mr. Baldwin has done everything he could to try to dismiss the case. But at this point, it appears the trial is going forward. Well, they haven't ruled on that motion to dismiss yet. But it would be. I might add. Unusual. At this point, still, neither, ha neither Hannah Gutierrez nor Mr. Baldwin has ever called Helena's mother. Olga to even say they were sorry for what happened. And I'm sure their lawyers have and told them not to. from the video that we showed in court how devastating this has been to Olga and to Anatoly and to Svetlana. Devastating does not begin to describe it. There'll be more from the family in the future. I'm sure there will be. Thank and you. she represents the family. I have some still photos. <laughs> She's like, and I have some pictures for you. 
I don't know about uh, about me, but I don't know if I'm plugging in somebody's uh, thumb drive. I think Steven made an excellent point saying a QR code with a link to a Dropbox would have been sufficient. Um, as she's handing out photos, I'm just going to leave that up on the screen in case anyone else decides to speak to the media. Oh. And I'm going to answer some questions. Um, that was loud. Reggie Ho said is Baldwin in jail on parole or bail? I don't know what. He's not on parole because he hasn't been sentenced. He is not in jail. He is, I believe, on his own recognizance after the refiling. I don't think they set bail in the case. Um, Cumulus Cloud said, and all of us cyber professionals at the networks are screaming, don't plug those in. Jack said, handing out mystery drives after trial. Yep. Oh. Are you making lunch plans, Carrie? Carrie's asking Gloria where she's headed. Are y'all going to lunch? Also, I know Gloria's in her 80s, but the, the hair is, uh, I'm a little envious. Where did her wheelie box go? Did somebody take it? I have questions. Okay. It looks like we are uh, just about done with um, any further press activity out in front of this courtroom. We saw that Bowles left um, and then the independent cuts their feet. All right. I think we're finally done with press conferences and with court for the day. Let's do a quick summation and get into Q&A because that's, uh, that's what we're doing. Yes. Do not fear, we will get back into some of the jail calls for those of you that did not hear them. Today in court, Judge Sommer, Sommer, S-O-M-M-E-R, I guess that would be Sommer, did not hold back in how she felt about Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's lack of remorse. She pointed directly to the defendant's jail calls that the prosecution summarized in their motion for sentencing and pointed out the utter lack of remorse, not only in the jail calls, but in Hannah Gutierrez-Reed's statements to the court, wherein she said that while she is sorry, she is not a monster, and that we are human and humans make mistakes. She also went to point out the conditions on the set and said that she tried to deal with it the best that she could. The judge had absolutely no patience for it, pointed out the fact that Hannah was sorry in her jail calls for only herself, her lack of modeling career, and continued to show no remorse for what happened and then sentenced her to the maximum potential sentence of 18 months in state prison and designated the conviction as a serious and violent felony, which not only bumps her time to uh, 80 five percent time but also changes the designation of her felony conviction and the impact it will have on her future um, as it goes to employment possession of weapons etc so hannah gutierrez will be transported from county jail or local custody to state prison in new mexico she did indicate in her jail calls that she wasn't inclined to show up to testify at baldwin's trial but also said she wanted to see Alec Baldwin in prison. So I guess the question for Baldwin's trial is, are we gonna see Hannah Gutierrez testify from prison at his trial? We could, which would be interesting to see. With all of that, the victim impact statements were heartfelt stories of the light that the victim in this case, Helena Hutchins brought to not just the world, but to her friends, her family, and the film industry of her dedication to optimistically making things beautiful to finding the shot that would make the movie memorable that she had no lack of support and love and effervescence for those around her and that she truly loved what she did and making beautiful things they were very impactful statements um they were they were just heart-wrenching because in criminal prosecutions the defendant's rights take precedence. Those constitutionally protected rights come first. 
And in all of it, the victims and their stories can get lost. And that has never felt more starkly than when you hear the impact statements from those who have been substantially impacted by the loss of life. And that includes statements from Helena's mother, her sister, her father. We did not see statements read into the record from Helena's husband or son, but we heard from her best friends, her coworkers, and Joel Souza. And with that, it's time to go to Q&A, and then we'll look at some of the jail calls, and we're gonna just take a collective deep breath. It's It should be noted that it is substantial that a first-time offender with no prior record on an involuntary manslaughter got a maximum sentence. That is unique and unusual. I would not say it's unheard of because it happens, but it is unique and unusual. Most people do not get a maximum sentence with no prior record, particularly on an involuntary manslaughter where the entire contemplation of the crime is that it was an accident but the recklessness or negligence led to that accident was severe enough that there should be criminal charges. Not every jurisdiction even has an involuntary manslaughter cause of action. Some countries don't have involuntary manslaughter because the belief in writing those laws is that sometimes an accident, though reckless, is truly an accident and that those are matters for civil courts, not for criminal courts. So it will be interesting to see how people view this sentence. It is difficult to look at Dave Halls, who was the safety coordinator on set, who got six months of unsupervised probation for taking a deal early. Though in taking that deal, he did have to express remorse. Hannah in her jail calls believes that he threw her under the bus to save his own ass. So there is a large disparity between Dave Hall's getting a six month probationary sentence, well, unsupervised probationary sentence, and Hannah Gutierrez getting 18 months in state prison. But I have to wonder, will Alec Baldwin's attorneys be calling the prosecutor and asking for their deal to be put back on the table where Baldwin could have accepted a guilty plea for six months of unsupervised probation? Will this sentence change how they go forward in their legal strategy before this judge? I guess we'll see. All right, let's go to Q&A right now. Wait, that's the wrong bumper. Emily, don't hit the wrong one. We're gonna have to whap the bumper multiple times today. Let's go. All righty, all righty then. Let's go to your questions and then we will pull up the jail calls. Kimberly in the chat said, Emily, why do you think Hannah's mom wasn't allowed in court today? Well, her outburst in court the last time and the fact that she was on jail calls with Hannah talking about the fact that they could just confront the prosecutor, I'm sorry, they could confront that bitch referencing the prosecutor um, in the public bathrooms because they all share the same bathroom. So I think the discussion of a confrontation uh, definitely went a little way in the decision to exclude Hannah's mother from court. Christopher T said, Emily, will Hannah serve the entire 18 months? No, she'll serve 85% of it with some time served for the uh, month-ish that she's been in. We're going to get to the jail calls in just a minute. So the outburst was at the very end of the jury verdict. Um, I went back and replayed it, I think during Q and A, because I was a little jumbled on verdict day. I was like picking my kid up from band as the verdict was coming down, which was a uh, delightful once, once he can drive himself home from school, things will be different, but I was a little jumbled and I think we got into a little bit of Q and A before we went back. And I was like, wait a second, what did her mom say? And it was something like, this is bullshit. This is fucking bullshit. Um, and then mom had to be escorted out of court, but she stood up and yelled at the court and at the prosecution. We'll talk about it in the jail calls soon. 
Paula Wood said what happened to Brandon Lee so many years ago, after what happened to Brandon Lee so many years ago, even on set, they need to proceed as any weapon is live loaded. It's supposed to, Paula. It's supposed to. It's supposed to. That's exactly what is supposed to happen. And it didn't. And Hannah was not the only one that failed on this set. I agree with the defense. Multiple people failed on this set. But if Hannah hadn't failed, no matter anyone else's failing, would we be here with someone who lost their life? And I think the answer to that question is no. Because if live rounds hadn't gotten on set, which the prosecution say came from Hannah, and it hadn't gotten loaded into the gun, which was her job to make sure they didn't, Baldwin acting like an asshole and pointing a weapon at somebody and firing it would not have ended someone's life in all reasonable likelihood. Yes, it can happen. Yes, it happened on the set of The Crow, but it is unlikely. You point a gun that is loaded with a live round at somebody and the, the likely improbable outcome is that someone is going to lose their life. And that can't happen without her or wouldn't happen without her. Smurf Anna said, could there be consequences for the paralegal? Probably not. Um, we'll get there in just a second. Becky Dog Lover said, at least she didn't hand out DVDs or floppy disks. I don't know, DVDs might have been safer than a thumb drive. Uh, professionals, security professionals in the chat, let me know. Tinsley's opinion said, don't be jealous, girl. Her hair is just stiff. No, it's voluminous though. I My hair is, is not nearly as thick. Danielle said, where were the statements from her husband? They might've been submitted to the court. They might not have been. Um, Carla said, question Emily, do you think she was unable to express too much accountability as they will be filing an appeal? No, because if, if there are legal issues as the defense pointed that there might be, her expressing remorse does not negate whether or not her trial took place fairly, though I should keep in mind, and sometimes it is hard for me to do, I should keep in mind that there are still a numerous, innumerous civil lawsuits happening. Johnny said, question, wait, Alec Baldwin was offered six months on supervised probation and declined? Yes, that doesn't seem very smart. Was Hannah offered a deal? Hannah was offered a deal. I have not found the filing yet, but I trust Runkle. Um, Hannah was offered a deal, but had to disclose where the live rounds came from. Um, Terry said, question, was there a fine imposed along with the 18 months? I did not hear any restitution, but there will be court fees and fines that will naturally attach. We'll see them when the filing order is up on the website. We can cover that. If it's up tomorrow, we can go over it real quickly. If not, I'll do it in quick bits next week. Um, K Rab said these drives are gifts or souvenirs. They are trial strategy. Aren't gifts or souvenirs. They are trial strategy for the civil cases. Elliot JN said, what impact will this sentence have on this selfie in the bathroom case? What could she be facing in that case? I have not pulled up the uh, potential sentencing in that case, but yes, it will have an impact because now she is a felon convicted of a serious and violent felony, already a serious and violent felony with a weapon. So it could enhance her time on that case. Or she could take a plea deal on that case and say, okay, well, I got 18 months. Can we just run it concurrent? Which also might be something they would consider doing. Uh, Maddie Flapp says, Alec Baldwin needs to show remorse and humility or he's toast. We'll see. Does Baldwin go in front of the same judge? Yes. Um, why was Hannah's mother not allowed in court? We'll get to that uh, in a minute. Uh, she isn't sorry for their loss. She's sorry for her own. Y yes. Uh, Hannah from her jail calls and other things seem uh, seems to feel very sorry for herself. And I think there's room for those things to run concurrently, right? There's, there's room um, for both, right? So there's room for both. Um, we're gonna get to why Hannah's mother, I believe wasn't allowed in court. Question, will anything happen with Carrie not handing over Seth's two hour interview? Probably, but also, uh, probably, I mean, probably, I can't imagine there won't be more motions about it. Questions in what state will Hannah serve her sentence? New Mexico. Um, okay. Caveat. 
generally New Mexico, unless there is overcrowding in the prisons, in which case the prison system might actually have, um, they might have compacts with other states wherein she could be transferred to other states. But I do not know the New Mexico prison system very well, but it is possible that she could serve time in other states if the women's prison in New Mexico is full. And if the women's prison in New Mexico is full, it would be a state penitentiary in another state, not a federal penitentiary in another state. Um, that happened commonly with men in California, where they would be serving their time sometimes in Georgia, sometimes in Florida, sometimes in Arizona, sometimes on the East Coast, just depending on whether or not the 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 level of crowdedness. It doesn't generally happen in the women's facilities. They tend to not be as overcrowded as the men's facilities, but that will depend on the nuance of New Mexico, but generally the answer is New Mexico. Uh, Northern New Mexico is under red flag warning Santa Fe while I've gusts up to 45 miles an hour today. I live close by. Well, everyone's hair definitely spoke to how windy it is. Uh, so there's that. Olga said, is anyone else getting Elaine vibes from Gloria? I mean, Gloria is is uh, is in her 80s. So I, I think that she handled it better than Elaine would have. Can the judge's statements be used in the Alec Baldwin case? Not really. Um, there's nothing there really for Baldwin. It was all smoke for Hannah. But what I have noticed is other, um, other coverage of this case has just a whole bunch of like Alec Baldwin's face in the thumbnails and stuff. I mean, everyone wants to make this case about Baldwin. I think it's appropriate to keep this case about Hannah, her job, what she did, what she didn't do, and the rest of it. I think it's appropriate to focus on Hannah in this case. Does this look bad for Baldwin? I imagine that he and his lawyers are having a conversation about this uh, thoroughly, thoroughly. Um, let's see. Will Baldwin's team be able to use the comment about, but for Hannah, but for you, Helena would not be dead. They are trying to, you know, go, they have argued that the jury instruction wasn't given properly at the grand jury. The state says that it was, but they're going to argue that, uh, Hannah's actions were an interceding cause that, um, that, kind of blocked Baldwin's responsibility. I don't know how far that would go because it, the same thought goes both ways, right? If Hannah had loaded a live round into the gun and Baldwin hadn't pointed it at a person, then Helena wouldn't have been shot. Um, pronounced like Inigo. Thank you, Inigo, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for, thank you for kindly <laughs> letting me know I am, I am the worst. So thank you, Inigo, I appreciate that. So there's two things. If it wasn't loaded with a live round, no one dies. If he hadn't pointed it at somebody and pulled the trigger, nobody dies. So both people can be responsible. Baldwin's trial will be in July. Um, so there's a lot of things that if Baldwin hadn't done A, B, C, or D, we wouldn't be here. SG Blues, did you ever run into Gloria in Los Angeles? No. Um, other high profile defense attorneys, yes. Um, Gloria Allred, no. So let's cover the rest of what the defense had to say. Um, Jess Rubery said, is it 18, is it 85% of 18 months or is the 18 months at 85? Or is the 18 months at 85? Um, Jess, there are different portions of time that you spend in custody depending on the level of the crime. So that can go from 50%, which depending on the state can get bumped down to less than that, to 85% where you have to serve eight, at, at a minimum 85% of your time. So it will be 85% of the 18 months, but you will subtract the time served first. So it'll be 85% of like 16, 16 ish months that she will serve because she will get credit for time served and the credit for time served generally will be at that 85% because the way that the time has been, um, because the way the time has been apportioned on the case. So yes, 85% of a total of 18 months, but she will get credit for time. So she's been in for like a month. Dear law nerds, don't forget to do the YouTube -y things. Yes, we've got a lot happening this week. Um, and I think you're not going to want to miss it if you like being in court. Sean said Hannah and her dad did a fantastic job of selling the court on jail time. 
Bowles gave a masterful example of gaslighting. Bowles definitely was like, no, no, Your Honor, my client really does feel remorse. Seriously. Um, Runkle said, Bowles, I swear, Your Honor, she's totally remorseful when no one except me is watching. Bowles was like, Your Honor, I can vouch for my client. I've ta I've talked to her and she's she's had breakdowns over this. I don't doubt that that's true. I don't doubt that that's true. I don't doubt that this has impacted Hannah's life. But I don't know if she feels for her impact in this or just the impact to her in this. Um, and also, Hannah clearly feels attacked by everyone from TMZ to the rest of it. Hannah's mother is why Hannah is Hannah. I mean, you guys can decide for yourself. Ashley, can Hannah get a new lawyer for appeal? I think Hannah would be well served by a public defender for her appeal. Here's why. Um, a public defender will be able to evaluate the actions of her current attorney. And I think uh, that's appropriate. Um, Ryan said, I'm shocked. Shocked, I say. I'm actually really surprised she got the max. Truly. Um, I thought we were... I thought we were at the maybe a year, maybe, maybe probation with suspended time. I am surprised that she got the max. Then again, once the judge started talking, it was like, oh, Hannah's statement also, oh, and then the jail calls, oh, bad. Rebecca Lillenfeld said, film editor here, actors do not point guns at other actors. They cheat the angle. And it's going to be a huge part of Baldwin's case, I think, because everyone in the industry and everyone who has shared their experience with the law nerds here, including yourself, and thank you, have said the exact same thing. There is no reason to point a loaded weapon at a person, especially in blocking. They shouldn't have even been using the weapon at blocking. Um, Hollis said Dave Halls took uh took a deal for a reason baldwin was super wrong in all of this and so was halls i still have a ton of smoke for dave halls um i don't like that deal i don't think the prosecutor this prosecutor likes that deal i don't like the deal it doesn't f however we have no control over it and i'm like i can't control that i don't like it though i do i do not like it um artist fleetwood said thank you for all you do for all of us you are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you guys too. I look, I love helping people learn about the law. I went to the DA's office to help. Um, I started when I left the DA's office, when that job wasn't working for me, I started a consulting business to help explain the law to people. When all of that changed during uh, COVID, I wanted to find a way that I could still help people engage with and understand the law in a way that not only I loved, but was needed. And I think understanding our law and our legal system is needed because then you can be like, I agree with that. I don't agree with that. A lot of you look at the way the sentencing worked in Utah on the Ruby Frankie case and went seriously WTF. Seriously WTF is happening with these being second degree felonies. And it helps, I think, figure out where, um, laws can change and laws can improve. And I think the only way to do that is to look at what's going on in cases and talk about why things are happening. And then if change needs to happen, go, and this is the change that needs to happen. And now I can see it because just saying the system doesn't work and you just go, the system doesn't work and I don't like the result doesn't give you the, the language or the direction to run in. The direction to run in is generally looking at the laws as they are and seeing where change can be impactful and going from there. So um, let's see. Um, Christina said, question, why did Hannah get 18 months when the Crumbly's got 10 to 15 years? I don't know what the Crumbly charges were. Were they involuntary? I don't know if the Crumbly's were involves. Um, different states, different states, different sentencing schemes, different laws. In the state system, it can vary greatly, but I don't know what the Crumblies were charged with. I did not cover it. Um, I gener I do not cover school shootings. I just do not cover school shootings. So I I don't know. Um, the chat is saying they were, but there were more charges um, because there were more victims, which makes sense. Uh, let's see. Question, wouldn't calls with the paralegal be privileged? 
I'm going to get through the rest of the defense statement generally. And if Runkle is still in the chat, he can speak to this. But generally, there is a way to identify that the calls are lawyer calls so that they are not recorded. So I don't know how that worked here um, and whether it went right or wrong. So uh, the the difference of the numbers of victims is also is also important, but I don't know all the charges uh, with the crumblies. So again, different states, uh, different sentencing, different laws, different sentencing schemes. With the Frankie case, I give the um, example of Los Angeles, multiple, vic multiple victims in child abuse cases would have uh, a sentencing enhancement for multiple victims. That doesn't exist. Um, let's see, Runkle is here and yeah, there should be a voice recording saying this is a recorded thing. There is, but I would think that there would be a way to, I think that there is a different designation to call in as the lawyer so that they are not recorded. But yes, uh, the lawyer should have noticed that from the recorded line or the paralegal should have noticed that. But either way, uh, it's here. Did Hannah know the calls are recorded? It says it at the beginning of every single call. Every single call. Every single call. All right, let's finish the defendant's statement and then we'll go to the jail calls, shall we? And then we will we will wrap up. Um, all right, let's. I got. I'm gonna rearrange. I'm gonna rearrange my screens just a little bit, chat, and then we will go to the. We'll go to the documents and take a look at. That's my notes. That's not the document. There's the document. Where did we get through? Oh, we got through the defense attorney burying the lead on the allegation that the prosecution did not turn over one of the witnesses calls like um why weren't there motions about this will we see motions about it we might that should never happen like seriously what so we are on page three of six of the defense motion continuing from the beginning of the stream indeed the defense says and yet another very problematic occurrence if this is true, it's it's more than problematic. Last week, the special prosecutor disclosed to counsel for the first time a prior interview of Seth Kinney with the district attorney's office, investigators that lasted two and a half hours. The statement isn't dated, but it was represented, represented as happening before trial. And it's also unclear who the investigators are from the district attorney's office. So he spoke to DAIs? The bottom line is the statement had to be turned over consistent with Brady and Giglio and their progeny. And that's what you're showing one with. And would have been used effectively in cross-examination of Mr. Kinney to rebut points made in his case. It's inconceivable. Inconceivable. I should have with that. It, this goes beyond problematic. If represented as the defense represented represents it. And I keep saying if. Because there are times when we get to the end of what the defense has said something is, and I'm like, that those words don't mean what you think they mean. But if this is what went down, I expect we will see more motions on it. It's inconceivable that the district attorney's office wouldn't have remembered this statement and to disclose it to the new special prosecutor. I mean, it's irrelevant. Because the prosecution is... Um, is responsible for it whether they knew about it or not so it doesn't matter um whether they knew it still has to get disclosed and it is a huge issue if it doesn't <laughs> runkle i see you in the chat saying i think it's very bold of bulls to say that he would have used anything effectively in cross-examination i mean that's true the fact that this this alleged and potential brady violation is a throwaway paragraph in this motion is also inconceivable. Bulls. If you should be making a literal fucking stink about anything, it's it's literally this. It's inconceivable that the DA's office wouldn't have remembered. I mean, that's not inconceivable at all. It's perfectly conceivable that the DA's office would have been like, oh, wait, we didn't tell you about that. Like, I can totally see that happening. It's irrelevant, though. They're responsible. They're responsible if it exists, even if they don't know it, the prosecution's obligation is to turn it over. And if they don't, it can be a issue that overturns a case on appeal. So there's that. 
he throws it away, which means he either doesn't think it's that important or um, doesn't see the import. <sighs> they say the interview includes the following statements and summary that Kinney made that were never disclosed to the defense prior to trial. I expect to see more motions on this. He praises Hannah's work at times in the interview. I think he did that in the other interviews too, though. He says there is a standard that the prop master is the boss. He says that Sarah is the boss, and if something goes missing or stolen, she has to report it. She is managing things, which allows the armor to focus on guns, and Sarah is everything else. And mentions that Hannah grew up on the set of movies and has a lot of immersion in the in set industry. Um, says she has more experience with westerns than he did up until 1883. He's not the armor, though. He says prop masters who handle guns won't call out armor to test bullets. Mentions that sheriffs confuse replica guns with real guns. Sarah told him Hannah was doing great with the guns and that the director was happy. I mean, was that before or after the See You Next Tuesday bomb got dropped on Sarah? I'm curious. Says he heard nothing but good things about Hannah's skills and um, all the stuff that came out after about safety he hadn't heard. He felt like people were piling on after the fact that actually might have been very helpful on cross. He mentions the anonymous hotline. And that if there was something going on, why didn't they call? Other witnesses mentioned that, but it would have been helpful, I think. Sabotage could be anyone on set. Nick Cage said, quote, Nick Cage, I, I'm sure wants to be excluded from this narrative forever. Nick Cage said, quote, she almost blew my eardrums out. Then Seth says, why did she get an invite to the next Nick Cage movie if that was true? He mentions a little girl on the set of the movie that Hannah taught to shoot. The girl gave her a tribute painting. Things went well there. Okay. Maybe she got beat down by the AD and Alec. Who said that, Dave? Who said, who said that? Seth Kinney said that. Maybe she did. Uh, but Seth Kinney was definitely a key witness. Quote, it's a boys club. Alec trust AD because he's a man. Quote, if she got pushed around, no one would disagree. She's got the experience. If she ever came up with that kind of defense, then I think, well, finally, you're going to be real about this thing. Okay. If the camera crew didn't feel safe, well, then call the hotline. It's kind of suspicious to me if they got their hotels would they have said they didn't feel safe talking about the camera crew? He apologized about Sarah's accidental discharge. Sarah was super responsible and apologized to everyone. Hannah was trying to punch down on Sarah for accidental discharge. The way that Kinney protects Sarah is odd to me. Accidental discharges happen. Mentions Tim McGraw, Daniel Craig, and Denzel having them. I'm not going to make jokes. I'm not going to make jokes about accidental discharges and Denzel. Emily? Rain in your brain. Chad, I'm going to let you do it for me. Um, He told Hannah to let it go about Sarah's accidental discharge. It's the discharge for me. I just, I just, I just can't, I can't, I can't. By the time we get to the next trial and we have to listen to half cock, full cock, quarter cock, all the cock, beating off the cock notch, by the time we get back to it, we will be talking about the accidental and premature discharge. He says the AD and Alec, quote, how are you not making sure a 24-year-old armorer has every ounce of support? Quote, she's got the experience in history. She has more set time on Westerns than I did before 1883. I mean, but not as the armorer. Just look, my mom was a flight attendant. I have spent a lot of times on planes. It doesn't mean I'm qualified to be a flight attendant. Like it's a job that is responsible for people's safety. I can't walk down an aisle with an open drink without being worried that I'm going to spill it. So no, just spending time at my parents' workplace does not qualify me for their job. My dad was a principal. Am I qualified to do that? No. Do I have the patience for teenagers or junior high school students? Also no. No. Nope. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. None. Uh, Hannah came out strong. She was pushed around by Alec and the AD. Props department needs every ounce of support. Quote, any work coming up, interviewer asked at the end, says, said, well, shit. 
with all the heat, they said maybe it's the maybe it's best you don't come back to the set of 1883. They don't know what to believe. My attorney's got things cleared up with the LA Times, but the collateral damage is there. Just trying to hit the reset button and get back to work in March. That I think could have been helpful. Would it have would it have changed the jury's mind? I don't know. But that could have, I can see the argument. I don't know why that argument didn't start at the beginning. These statements individual, like, why isn't this a separate motion? These statements individually and collectively are exculpatory and clear Brady and Jiglio disclosures. Um, I see Lisa in the chat saying, my dad is an ER doc. Am I qualified? No, only for my own first aid certs, right? I spent a lot of time at my husband's dental office. You still don't want me doing a crown prep for you, like, at all. I can tell you which which bleach I like better and the toothpaste I enjoy, but am I qualified? No. How much time have I spent at a dental office? Way too much. Oh, I'm not a dentist by proxy. Uh, they should be considered by this court as well. No, these need to be separate motions. And I imagine you need to make a motion noticing appeal for Brady violations, a motion to suspend sentence pending appeal, which is going to be difficult with 18 months. But like, there's a bunch of motions that need to happen. Like, stat. accordingly, Ms. Gutierrez Reed requests this court to consider the totality of the circumstances and information provided. He didn't say much about the jail calls, did he? Jason Bowles, Bowles Law Firm. Um, because it was raised in the chat, I really want to. Um, I really want to go look at the other pleadings and see if the firm signed them differently before Bullion got leaded or yeeted from trial. So I'm gonna go pull one of the old filings real quick and see if there was a change there just cause now I'm curious and I can't let it go. Uh, let's see. We're gonna pull one of the earlier motions from before trial, let's see. Um, these are from 2023. That should be good enough. February here. Uh, these were still listed as separate law firms. So this was Jason Bowles, the Bowles law firm and Todd Bullion. Um, so they weren't listed together in February, uh, February, 2024. So Bullion was listed, but not as a partner. So it doesn't look like there's anything. Monica Barreras was li listed, was not at sentencing. I wonder if she's working on motions. Let's pull up the state's um, response to the defendant's sentencing memorandum because we're going to go through those. Also, Quick Bits is out today. I go over these in Quick Bits. If you want um, to pull that up, it's just in the app. It's the last, other than this video, the last video posted, so you can grab it from the app. Um, let's see. Nanner said, can you spill the paste bleach, please? So yes, I have sensitive teeth. I really like Crest White Strips because they do not make my teeth hypersensitive and they're still effective if you use them like daily or every other day and don't leave them on too long because my teeth are incredibly sensitive to bleach. So I really, really like the Crest White Strips. I find them accessible and easy to use and they don't make your teeth oversensitive and you don't have to go to the dentist and get trays made and you don't have to use a higher concentration of bleach. I find them to be very effective. So that is what I use, um, again, because I have sensitive teeth. Some people can handle a stronger bleach, which will get the result faster. I'm all like slow and steady so I can still eat the next day. Slow and steady, slow and steady so I can eat the next day. Make sure that you um, know how, how you respond to tooth bleach because that tooth pain is, is rough. All right. This is the state's response. We have gone through part of this this morning. Let's swoop and go to just the jail calls, shall we? Let's do it. Also, you guys have pointed out, you spend a lot of time in the chat here. Does that make you trial lawyers? I think so. I think so. Based on based on all of that, I think I think all, we're all trial lawyers now. I think we're there. Uh, let's see. We're not gonna go through the law on the serious violent offense designation. Like, I think they were asking for for the court to yeet it. And I think the, um, I think the, the jail calls 
persuaded the judge. For those of you complimenting my teeth, I get it. Um, this is like, I'm on my third round of Invisalign. So we, we there has been effort put into these teeth. Um, <laughs> they were not naturally that way. All right, let's go to a summary of the jail calls. We're going to do them all. You ready? Do we have a minute? We have a minute. Okay, we're going to do them all. And then we are going to wrap up a few last questions. And then we are going to zoom, zoom. Um, Candace, yes, 18. I'm res checking me a second while I respond to my friend Candace's text message um, because I know she's watching the stream. Candace, yes, 18 months was the absolute max. Um, her mom was not allowed in court today. We're going to get into it in the jail calls. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. These are a sampling of the 200 jail calls. Do we have the audio of these? Not yet. Is Emily thinking that a FOIA request needs to happen immediately after this? Yup. 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 There is no audio. There is no direct transcript. There is the prosecution summary. The defense did not say these were inaccurate. The defense said, well, the way we talk to people um, is not always uh, delightful. The defense didn't say this didn't happen. The defense didn't say that the prosecution misrepresented these calls. 200 calls is going to be a lot of calls. So, um, Patty, yes, we do have Sensodyne, uh, and Sensodyne can absolutely help. So yes, we do need the calls. 200 is a lot of calls, but we need the calls. Hannah says the other girls in jail were saying that, quote, I can't believe they threw your pretty little white ass in here for nothing. I think Hannah liked being called pretty and little. Hannah says, like, yeah, girl, for real. She says that so far she is built for jail and likes tap water. She likes hard beds and cat food isn't too bad every day. The male says, this is the male on the other end of the phone, says that when Hannah was taken away that her mom said, this is some bullshit. I can't remember if it was bullshit or fucking bullshit. Hannah laughs loudly and tells her, he tells her what mom did. And Hannah says that she was glad her mom stood up and said something. Hannah laughs about all of this. The male says he has been to jail before. She says she didn't think she would like it, but now she does. Hmm. Hannah says that she can't believe that the judge put her in jail. Hannah talks about the jury and how they only took two fucking hours. I mean, I thought it was kind of fast. And how she got the book thrown at her oh oh past hannah you have not seen the book until today that book didn't get thrown that book got freaking yeeted for those of you in the chat saying wait these are the calls these are summaries and direct quotes of the calls she complains uh wait a sec she says that everyone lied on the stand except for two or three experts. She talks about the witnesses and how they all lied. She says that she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time. The, the judge quoted that back to her. In your police interview, Hannah, do you not remember saying, I wish I would have checked them more because I remember it. But no, they all lied. She said, quote, she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time and this is why you're going to prison she complains about what happened on set and says pick people are still going to die on set she complains about gabby pickle she complains about the jury and how and how people who got immunity and had pending lawsuits i mean i complain a lot about the people who got immunity i mean same she says she wishes tmz would shut up and that quote literally she's fine She complains about the Washington Post and how if they talked to any worker in there, they would all say she's happy and bubbly. I missed it. Chat, did the did TMZ and, and WAPO say that she was struggling in custody? Like, why is she like, I've got this? I don't know. I missed those stories. She talks about being a felon and how it's going to work with all of his guns. And I wonder if this was a conversation with her dad and how she isn't sure how it will work. She says that he can put them in a safe and he can tell them that she doesn't know the combo. She was planning. She was planning to get around the prohibition on weapons. You could just say, I don't know. 
you could just say, I don't know the combo so I can still access the guns. Look, man, I worked in a lot of like vehicular homicides and most of the defendants, particularly in the non DUI related homicides, but sometimes in the DUI related homicides, never wanted to drive a car again. Never. Like they were so altered and, and in involuntary manslaughter, so altered by the thing that happened that they never wanted to drive again. I can't imagine her being like, yeah, I don't understand why the guns are locked up. Can't imagine. Just, there was an invol that still breaks my heart. And it's, I'm not going to talk about it much because I will not, I'm not able to, but the defendant, it was a horribly tragic accident. I didn't love the way it got charged. I know why it got charged, but it was charged as a misdemeanor. The victim was in the crosswalk, but had gotten into the crosswalk late and the driver could not see them as they got into the crosswalk after everybody else had cleared the crosswalk. And that's the only reason it was charged because the victim was in a crosswalk. Getting into crosswalks when somebody's making a turn against the crosswalk is, is dangerous. The devastation from the defendant was palpable from the beginning. The defendant was devastated that this happened and you could see it. It was absolutely awful. Um, so I have seen involuntary manslaughter cases where the defendants are also absolutely devastated. This is not that case. She talks about how she is wrongly incarcerated after Hannah, oh. after Hannah was taken into custody, Hayden, the other party on the call goes to her hotel room to clean up. And Sean says, quote, where did this bottle of crown Royal come from? Hayden claims it and says, Sean wasn't thrilled. That was well, she was pending trial. Hannah talks about playing games with the other inmates. Hannah says she's fine in there. Hannah talks about suing various media outlets. Hannah goes back to TMZ and how she is built for jail. TMZ, Hannah would like you to know that she is built for custody. Um, she would like that headline apparently. Hannah says that if she's subpoenaed to Baldwin's trial, she will not show up. Well, babe, you're gonna be in prison. They'll just bring you uh, even if you don't wanna be there. And that's gonna go something like this. Carrie Morrissey. Good morning, Ms. Gutierrez Reed. You have been called here to testify today. Ms. Gutierrez Reed. Fuck you, bitch. I'm not saying shit. Carrie Morrissey. Ms. Gutierrez, do you understand that you have subpoenaed to testify and failing to do so could be a uh, contempt of court? Hannah Gutierrez, probably. Fuck you. I'm not saying shit. Has that colloquy ever happened to me in any of my cases? Yes. So, um, she might change her mind and decide she wants to go to custody or wants to go to um, court for the day. Can she plead the fifth? To some things, possibly, depending on the status of her appeal, but to other things, maybe not. Also, if Hannah gets up and refuses to testify, she becomes an unavailable witness and it might open the door for them to play some of her interviews that are relevant and that might be what they want to do anyway. So they might just pull her out and have her refuse to testify and then treat her as a hostile witness and then she still refuses to testify and then she's unavailable and then they might get into her recorded statements and that might be all they want, but that's a conversation for another day. So, um, mom says that she was held in jail for three weeks for contempt. Was the mother placed into custody? At, that's my question. Was the mom held in contempt for the outburst at sentencing or is this a different time? Hannah complains that she shouldn't be subpoenaed if Baldwin didn't show up for her. Girl, did you think Baldwin was gonna show up for you? Did your lawyers tell you that he would? Cause like, really? The judge is giving her time for no reason. Yeah, no reason at all. 
the judge isn't fair and they are going to the Supreme Court. I don't know if the Supreme Court in New Mexico is going to uh, give you the result you're hoping for, but this latest motion, interesting. Hannah doesn't understand why the judge locked her up when she was on terms of release. Hannah says she's trying to get Carmela, Jason Bowles' paralegal, to talk to the family of Helena about coming to sentencing to speak on her behalf. Hannah talks about the friends she is making and how she is having fun. She says she doesn't want to go to prison for 13 months, but it is what it is. Hannah says she is having more fun in jail than he, the other party on the call, did. Hannah says jail isn't like summer camp. But it's kind of like summer camp. Well, I'm curious to see the difference between her perception of jail and her perception of prison. Hannah says that everyone is going to get reviewed and that she feels like people were paid off to look the other way. Hannah goes into some sort of conspiracy theory, that's the prosecution's characterization, about how she was used as a pawn. Hannah says it's not too bad in jail. I'd actually be interested to hear that because, look, I do think a lot of people in this were trying to save their own ass. It doesn't negate her liability. Hannah complains about what was allowed at trial and what wasn't allowed. The rules of evidence are finite. Hannah says that the judge is terrible and Carrie got together with the judge and they were against her. Hannah complains about how it's so unoriginal. Hannah, it's giving everyone who's ever been convicted ever. The prosecutor and the judge are in on it. They're not. Mm -mm. Hannah complains about how fast the jury deliberated. Hannah says everyone who testified was given immunity, had a lawsuit pending or was part of the problem. She calls the jury offensive things, quote, when they say a jury of your peers, they mean fucking idiots, but stronger. Uh, Hannah says Carrie is a bitch and she's doing it out of spite. <laughs> Calling the prosecutor a bitch, also very original. Hannah thinks the judge is getting paid off and thinks she deserves credit for being respectful. She is mad because she isn't going to get bail. I bet she's madder today. She says there is a lot of nice things about jail and that it is a forced break from life. It It is a forced break from life. It It is a forced time out. She says that she paid a guy named Roger $3,000 to be her PR person. Um... Hmm. She says that Jason Bull needs Jason Bulls needs to talk to Rogers to get to Roger to get everything out. I'm wondering what Roger is doing uh, now. Hannah and her mother joke about her mom getting thrown out of court and that the judge is a menace. Hannah thinks her mom thanks her mom for the outburst. Hannah was thinking that mom was going to be behind her getting booked into jail. Ciara in the court says she does realize this is recorded, right? They say it at the beginning of every single call, every single one, every single one. So this is part of why I think mom wasn't allowed back into court today. Not only did mom have an outburst at, uh, at her conviction and the reading of her verdict, but she and her mom are joking on the jail calls that Hannah thought her mom was gonna be right behind her getting booked into jail for contempt. And Hannah said, thank you. Hannah says the judge was on a power trip. Mom wants to pick at the court. Hannah wants to pull in the governor and quote unquote, fuck this bitch up. It's hard to know who or what she is referring to as the bitch. I like that the prosecutor was like, it's you or me, your honor, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who's the bitch, but it's it's one of us. Hannah seems happy and is talking about cutting her friend's hair. Hannah is wishing they had hula hoops in jail. Mom recommends writing a book about this whole thing before somebody else does. She might try to do that. Hannah says that she has already been punished for this. Carmela Bowles is paralegal says that she knows Hannah is sorry. Carmela says Carrie is lying about everything. They blame the child on set for being dangerous on set. Hannah talks about the kid getting the gun that was, quote, just lying around. Hannah, remind me whose job it is. Just remind me whose job it is 
to make sure the guns aren't just lying around. Did I, did I slip into an alternate universe? Also, writing a book is going to fuck you up. CEG, where's my Keefe D book? Damn it. Hold on. I don't have Corey Richens' book. I'm not gonna buy it. Hold on. I have demonstratives. Writing a book is going to get you fucked up. Ask Keefe D. Ask Courthouse Becky. Exhibit one, exhibit two. Writing a book is not going to help. Ask Corey Richens. Okay. Carmela says Carrie is lying about everything. They blame the child on set for the gun that was just lying around. Carmela tells Hannah, I don't trust Carrie to not be recording these calls. I don't trust that bitch. I will just point out that Bowles didn't say anywhere in his motions that the calls with Carmela were improperly recorded. He didn't mention it once. Hannah says if she has to stay in jail longer that she is down for prison. Hannah says there's more to do in prison and talks about going to Springer where she could ride horses. Well, ma'am, um, I hope you get the assignment that you want. They talk about using her father's leukemia to keep her out of prison. They want to say that her and her mom are the only people who can help her dad. Hannah talks about her publicist and how it's time to make some statement from him. They talk about how it might work if Hannah says that she is the sole caretaker of her father. Hannah says jail isn't too bad and that some parts of it are just fine. They talk about how Hannah can do that time standing on her head. She's like, I got you. I got you. I got you. Hannah talks about her statement to the judge. Mom talks about the saying, uh, saying something to the judge. And Carmela apparently told her that she can say whatever she wants at sentencing. And the worst that can happen is spending a couple days in jail. Oh, I think... I think I misread this the last time I read it, which is always nice to go over it um, more than once. Mom talks about saying something to the judge. So mom wants to give a statement. And the paralegal said to the mother, to Hannah's mother, you can say whatever you want. The worst that can happen is spending a couple days in jail, like for contempt. I misread that the first time. This is not Hannah spending a couple days in jail. This is mom saying, I'm going to say whatever the fuck I want. And the paralegal said, uh, worst that can happen is you spend a couple days in jail. So go off, queen. Yikes. That's not going to help your kid, though. Hannah asked Carmela to reach out to Helena's husband and son to support her at sentencing. Can you fucking imagine? Hi, the armorer who loaded a live round into the gun that killed your wife would love it if you would come support her at sentencing. Hannah says jail is a forced vacation. Well, I'm glad she sees it uh, that way. And that she's doing fine. And if she has to spend more time in jail, it'll be okay. Well, um, sometimes... Uh, a dream is a wish your heart makes, and the court's going to make sure that that happens. Hannah says the jury didn't look at the evidence and are assholes. I mean, I think they looked at the evidence enough to acquit you of the stupid tampering with evidence charge. Hannah says the people that testified against her just wanted to talk shit, and she got railroaded. Carrie lied in her closing statement. Hannah wants to go after people for libel. Hannah is mad that the whole thing got pinned on her. Hannah says that jail is good character development. The judge wanted to make sure you had some more of that. Hannah wants them to put Alec Baldwin in jail also. I'm sure he'll be thrilled to hear it. Hannah asks her mom to tell the judge about her father's leukemia diagnosis and how she takes care of him when her mom isn't there. Hannah tells her mom what to say about how she takes care of her dad. 
Hannah says the jury was so fucking stupid they couldn't tell what was happening. She calls the jury fucking idiots. Hannah says she doesn't feel like she deserves to be there, and the jail guards agree with her. Hannah thinks the judge got paid off. They talk about the call being recorded and how they need to talk about people by their names instead of by bitch. I don't know. I think actually not legal advice, but I would say if you're going to talk about people on jail calls, if you talk about all the different bitches, it makes it harder for everybody to determine which bitch you're talking about. I take the opposite stance. They complain about the time the jury took to deliberate and how they didn't look at the evidence. Again, the split verdict uh, disagrees. They talk about how she shouldn't be a felon and maybe they can get it knocked down to a misdemeanor. Cue the sure Jan. Um, Cause it's now a serious and violent felony. So from getting it bumped down to a misdemeanor to 85% time is a big swing um, between expectations and reality. Hannah wants to bother the governor for the rest of her life so she can be pardoned. I don't know if the governor is going to be empathetic after this, but maybe. Hannah doesn't feel like she should be a felon because she has never been arrested. That's not how that works. Hannah says the judge wanted to lock her up. You've read the situation correctly. You continue to read that correctly. Hannah and her mother talk about how the system failed her. Okay. We're not going to we're not going to talk about how the system failed. Uh Helena because there were safety procedures. Um Okay. She's having a movie night in jail and watching Frozen. Well, maybe she'll find a way to let it go. Hannah's boyfriend says that he is trying to quit smoking weed. Hannah says that she won't have anyone to smoke with and that she is going to smoke weed when she gets out. Um Hannah, if you get out on parole, that's not going to work. Hannah's mother says that Hannah should fight the biggest girl of the bunch that is causing problems. Um, ma'am, when you head to prison, I don't know if that's going to, I don't know if that's going to serve you well. Mom says that she can't promise she will be calm and cool at sentencing. Well, she wasn't there. Mom says she's going to go in disguise if they don't let her in. Mom says it's lucky that all she did at the verdict was yell. Hannah says she got moved to 300 and it's, quote, fucking lit in here right now. 300 would be a different grouping. Hannah complains about the jail guards. Hannah was accused of passing notes to some male inmate and sparked some sort of investigation. Hannah says she has Regina as a roommate and it's fun as fuck and not bad at all. Well, I'm glad you and Regina are having a blast in custody. Hannah's the sarcasm, the sarcasm, the sarcasm. And I saw the question coming through the chat from Ciara Elaine saying, you can't smoke on parole even if it's legal. You can't smoke or drink even if it's legal. There are lots of restrictions on behavior depending on the case, but um, alcohol restrictions, and other restrictions are very, very common. So even, even if it's legal, there can be substance restrictions. Um, let's see. Hannah says that she has a she has had a good day and has had fun with another inmate. She says it's crazy good vibes. Vibes. Uh crazy good vibes today, and everyone is having fun because they got their commissary. Yeah. Yes. Hannah talks about some new medication she got that made her loopy. She talks about working out. Hannah says she likes the new medication because it makes her feel high. Hannah complains about the jury instructions and Hannah doesn't understand why she is in there. Hannah says this whole thing has been a character attack on her, which the judge noted at sentencing. And Hannah said at in her statement to the court, she had a chance to address everything she wanted to say. And Hannah's statement to the court was, I'm not a monster. We're humans. Um, Hannah complains that she has all the fame of a public figure, but none of the benefits. Ma'am. Hannah says that this is all she is going to be known for. 
I mean, there's a certain amount of the population that's going to remember that you smuggled a gun in your butt into a bar. So there's also that. Mom asks whether or not Helena's friends and family are going to write letters for her. For her Hannah or for her Helena? Hannah says she is nice and safe in jail. Well, I'm glad. Hannah says that they, referring to law enforcement and the prosecution, don't even have all her supplies. So how can they pin it on her? And that is reasonable doubt enough. They talk about how much of Hannah's life they could take up and that this is messing up her modeling career. Hannah thinks the producer should be in jail. They complain about Dave Halls and how he fucked Hannah to save his own ass. I mean, on that, I don't disagree. I would have this, I would have the smoke for Dave Halls too. Hannah is dismissive of the judge talking about how someone, uh, about someone dying as a result of her actions. That is what the judge said when she put Hannah into custody after the conviction and after the verdict. Hannah talks about how she is in good spirits. She really is fine in jail and some days she really likes it there. Hannah says the prosecution bored the jury for nine days and then when the defense put on their case, the jury was bored. I think a riveting defense attorney um, can, can uh, rectify that. They think the jury must have been tampered with. They feel let down by the FBI. Hannah says if the whole thing wasn't so comical, she would be upset. Mom yells that Hannah didn't cause Helena's death and Hannah agrees. Hannah and her boyfriend talk about Hannah drinking and how she is mean to him when she drinks. Based on the timeline of their relationship, she had to have violated her conditions. She wasn't allowed to drink when she was out pending trial. She had to have violated her conditions because there is another call where they talk about it being their six month anniversary. Hannah says she deserves a new trial and that this is bullshit. Hannah talks about her job at Mattress World and how she doesn't want her job back, but maybe does because she will need a job. She will need a job. Hannah wants to get on unemployment and she thinks about losing her job due to incarceration is the best way to get on unemployment. Hannah says she should have signed the plea deal and then just gone to the news and denied it. Um, ma'am. I want to hear this call, like the entirety of this call. Was it like, I should have just taken I should have just taken the deal and then told everyone I didn't. Are you trying, what are you trying to achieve by that? Protecting your representation, protecting your reputation? Like, what are you trying to achieve by denying that you took a plea deal in the media? Like the court records are public. Hannah says she's looking at 13 months, which is ridiculous over what happened. I mean, 18. But I guess with time, uh, with time served in jail. Hannah thinks the paramedics should be in jail for intubating Helena wrong. Hannah says mom can also give Carrie two or three of her pay stubs to quote, shut that bitch up. Hannah tells mom to get the ones where she has 38 or 40 hours. So it shows she has a full-time job and not the ones that show less. Hannah can't believe how many people are trying to ruin her. Hannah says everyone thinks it's crazy that she got locked up with her history. Hannah says she shouldn't be in jail because she has no priors. Hannah complains that they literally put her in there with murderers. Hannah says that people have accidents and people die. It's an unfortunate part of life, but it doesn't mean she should be in jail. This is not a shit happens situation. Hannah says that the medic on the set of Russ is a dumb bitch and should have been prepared. I vividly remember the EMT's testimony. The EMT's testimony was fucking heartbreaking. She was prepared for heat and wind and snake bites and sunburns and things that happen on movie sets. People falling off of horses and needing to be made stable to be transported to deal with broken bones. What she did not have the adequate supply for is two gunshot wounds on set in a incredibly remote area. That is not what she was prepared for because it isn't something that she could be prepared for. She does not have hospital grade equipment on a movie set. 
they talk about the paramedics taking too long. Remote location. And that she would still be here today if they had done it right and not and and not intubated her right. I think that's a misstatement. Except that the bullet did in fact sever her spine. She calls the paramedics fucking idiots and more. Mom says, how is that on you? Um, I don't know. Are we at audacity or are we at what the fuckery? I feel like we're at what the fuckery. So for those of you that are, are new law nerds, we're going to go to Code Red. For any of you that may be flash sensitive, Code Red is flashy until the music stops. But you will have a moment to um, to look away from the screen while it flashes. We had set a code of fuckery and then we've gotten to a code Fred, a code audacity, and now a code what the fuckery because sometimes shit is fuckery. And so that's where we're at. We're going to code red in three, two, one. So the mom said, uh, how are the, how is, how is any of this on you with the paramedics? Also, we're now fully at all the red lights. It's more dramatic at night. Mom wonders if Carrie, the prosecutor is going to be at sentencing, ma'am. Yes. Mom says, quote, she don't want to see me. Mom says, don't need that bitch there. You actually do need that bitch there. That bitch is the prosecutor and the prosecutor needs to be there to, uh, Prosecute. Mom wonders if Carrie is going to be at sentencing. Mom says she don't want to see me. Mom says don't need that bitch there. Hannah tells her that they all use the same bathroom as the public and chuckles. So um, there's a lot here to indicate why mom wasn't at sentencing. Uh, we've got numerous statements indicating why mom ha wouldn't have been allowed at sentencing. I imagine courthouse security probably told Bowles that so he could have addressed it with mom, uh, in advance of the sentencing. Will mom make a statement to the media? I don't know. Will every media outlet try? I imagine that they will. I imagine that every media outlet will try and see what mom has to say and that you might see those things um in the media in the coming days but the jail calls are a huge factor in this and i think it is somewhat poignant that once again hannah gutierrez is the state's best evidence against hannah gutierrez and sitting in court going like this isn't going to change it Um, so with that, I'm going to get to a few more questions as we recap that. And then I am going to have to scoot. Why? Because I am starving. Runkle says the, this is recorded message is way longer and warns that if you don't want to record a call, hang up the lawyer number things just says, thank you for using telemate. Thank you, Runkle. Um, if you guys don't follow Runkle of the Bailey, not only is he a weapons expert, but he also is a criminal defense attorney in Canada. And he's got great breakdowns on all the gun side of this case and where the statements Baldwin has made have doomed him um, with examples of how all that works in a way better than I can do. He's also a tremendously smart attorney as are the attorneys that give comment on these cases, Law and Lumber, um, Natalie Lawyer Chick, Boss Attorney Bree, Lawyer You Know, there are many that have great perspectives. And again, we all come at it from a different angle because we all have different experiences with work. Um, but Runkle, hands down, has some of, if not the most weapons experience um, of anyone that I've come across. And it's it's incredible to see him break that down. And the chat is saying, plus he is a Targaryen. <laughs> Take that for what it is. Runkle says, if it's the same system as here, which I think it is, they put your phone number down as lawyer number and the system doesn't record, it gives a different message. Thank you, Runkle. I, again, on the DA and we just get the calls that we get and then we um, listen to them to see what's going on on the calls. Princess Claudia said, I love that lip gloss. Thank you. 
Um, Kathy, congratulations on one year as a law nerd. Music to my soul said the judge demeanor here makes me think that if Baldwin shows any annoyance or antics during his case, she won't tolerate it either. Thoughts? I, you know, I, I'm going to have to think about it because I really liked the judge's demeanor during the motions hearing. And then we got to trial and the judge was just like, don't make me take away your coffee. I'm like, your honor, where did you go? Like, there was no control of the courtroom. Uh, so I don't know how I feel about it. Um, and I don't know how this judge will do with Baldwin in the courtroom. I was surprised um, by the change in demeanor between the hearings where she had so much control of the proceedings and court where she just kind of let them run amok and then threatened to take away their coffee like naughty children. It was weird. Kat Perez said, hello, EDB and chat. I'm here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm not shocked by the sentence. She should be heading off to Grants, New Mexico for summer camp, girl. Well, I imagine it's starting to get hot there in New Mexico. Um, so, Emily, thank you so much for covering the Reed case. Just love watching you. You're awesome. Well, thank you. I have questions. I, I am, I was fascinated by this case. I realized that this case only got attention in the context of Baldwin, which frustrates me a bit. Um, but it seems that she only got. Uh, this case only got covered in context of Baldwin by most, not here, but by by most in the the more legacy media. There's always a Baldwin angle to it. This case needed to be discussed on its own for the job the armor was supposed to do for the other safeties that failed on set, but what her job was, which gave us a lot of context going into the Baldwin case in July. When Hannah Gutierrez spoke about the conversation with the paralegal to a different person, is it still privileged? No. When once you start talking about it through her to a third party, it's not at all. Daryl Brooks used jail conversation in his sentence too. Um, the Daryl Brooks judge used his, yes, she did. It's not, this isn't uncommon. It's very common, especially when somebody gets remanded into custody for the first time, they tend to talk quite a lot. Tinsley said, imagine talking about how jail is not as bad and the judge saying, good, stay there. Talk about your mouth writing a check. Mm-hmm, sure did. Good to see you, law nerds. Um, Candy Scraft said, yeah, I must be an expert by now. You've been a law nerd for 16 months. I think that equals law school. Um, Marissa said, thank you for those who gifted memberships. Uh, got this far. Thanks to y'all. It means so much. That's amazing, Marissa. Captain We the Barmy, good to see you in the chat. Hannah Gutierrez Reed equals bullet. AB equals pulled trigger, period. Kathy Sharp said, bottom line, that gun should not have, uh, gun should not be in use. That gun could be in use shouldn't have been in use at the time because they were blocking shouldn't have been loaded with a live bullet shouldn't have been shouldn't have been pulling the trigger like there's a lot of shouldn'ts in all of this um in my opinion hannah gutierrez was not raised with the term empathy i don't know is the remorse in the room with us slushy slush fund that could you show us where it is please edb please can you send olivia some love uh, Sienna Bird, yes, we are sending love to Olivia for whatever Olivia needs love for. Um, I am the only person Hannah Gutierrez reads feels sorry for is herself. It seems to be true. Um, and again, I, I, I wonder if my experience with that would be different if I hadn't worked in cases where I've seen such a gamut of remorse from defendants and I've seen defendants be incredibly devastated uh, and and authentically and genuinely devastated by things that have happened and so to look at her face in court it's just the longer you do the job the easier it is to be like I see it with you uh nope and it just I don't remorse is part of sentencing considerations it absolutely is. And the judge is like, what you need is a longer time out from society to sort this out. Because if she gets out of custody embittered, it doesn't mean that this won't spiral out more. And it doesn't mean that her behavior won't spiral out more. Why are you alleged to be smuggling a gun into a bar? For what purpose? Rhonda said, it's been an eventful 19 months, cancer free, one year now, life is great. Hold on, we're gonna clap. Congratulations, Rhonda, so happy to hear it. 
Carpal tunnel surgery in both hands is a lot, and now I'm fantastic. Life with you is the best. Well, Rhonda, we have marked some big moments in life with you while you've been here in the chat, and we'll see what is to come. Um, Paula said, question, is it possible that Helena's husband was prevented from giving an impact statement because of his settlement with Rust? No, he could still make an impact statement. He might have chosen not to. Um, did you ever work with or against Gloria Alred? No, I did not. Our paths did not cross in, uh, in that way or in any way, I should say. I don't want to be unclear. Oh, what time is it? Oh, no. I forgot I had an appointment at three o'clock. Chat. I have to go. I completely forgot. Oh, no. I have an appointment at three. I have to zoom, zoom. Chat. Oh, my God. My calendar notification just went off. Mods, I appreciate you. Chat. Tomorrow we are covering TikTok Psychic, but after the court hearing, so it's going to be a little late. Um, Mingalina, will you let Chris know to call and tell them I'm on my way? Chad, I'm sorry that I have to bounce. I appreciate you. ADHD is a, a gift that keeps on giving, and I will talk to you soon. Love you. Bye. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnerdapp.com or search the app store for Lawnerd. You can also follow me around social media. And don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd.